Welcome to Iron Sights. This podcast candidly seeks to create opportunities and deliver impact by sharing the experiences and wisdom of successful entrepreneurs and thought leaders who unapologetically aim to win in health, fitness, business, and life. I'm your host, Scott Howell. Welcome to Old School Meets New School. Tradition meets innovation and imperfection meets excellence. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. All right, here we go. So I want to welcome uh, sort of a, a good friend and actually uh, a guy that I really look up to, really, really admire. His name is Dr. Bob, uh, Bob Porzio, who's here today. He is a doctor of osteopathic medicine. He spent several years as a emergency med- um, in emergency medicine, sorry, and he now specializes in anti-aging and functional medicine. Um, so, Bob, Yo. thanks for coming in. Great to see you again. Yeah, man. It's been a long time. As yeah. We were just kind of catching up off air here, just kind of talking about when it's been, and I, we were just relating back. It's been a year. Uh, yeah. A lot's yeah, happened. Almost to the date, probably. Yeah, for, totally. Yeah. We were doing uh, COVID antibody testing right. here, and that was the last time we, we, we sort of connected. Yeah, and I was just disappointingly negative because I thought I had COVID in January. I could have swore, you know, and uh, I didn't. Well, you know, that was an interesting part that came out of that whole situation for us. So many people were coming in going, I had this shit. Like I I was so sick in, you know, in January, I was so sick in December, you know, I know my kids had it really bad and then I had this thing or, or whatever. And we were getting, we were getting a lot of negatives and people were like, oh, really? Disappointed. They were disappointed. Uh They weren't getting the confirmation bias, you know, part of it and the, and what was going on. However, what was interesting that was going on at that same time was Stanford had done this huge study up here, which they got a lot of blowback on um, from the medical community, yeah. uh, the epidemiology community. Was that the Ioannidis study? I, I believe John Ioannidis. I think yeah. so. Yeah. I, I, now, I, that I'm not sure of, but I okay. know what they were coming out with was is they were somewhere, coming in somewhere around like 10 to 12 percent positivity. Okay. On And they were testing for antibodies. And so what they had done is then obviously extrapolated out all the numbers and what, you know, yeah. what they assumed what was going to be happening. And the scientific community was looking and going, this doesn't sound right. Mm-hmm. Something's not right about this because we think it's a lot more. Yeah. And we think this thing's been around for a lot longer than it has. I can tell you, we tested almost 500 people before we shut it down. Okay. And so that's, it was a pretty good mm-hmm. sample study. And I think what's interesting about that is it was very concentrated because people weren't coming. We, this is not like a massive area. Let's say they were coming down as far as San Francisco mm-hmm. and they were coming down for as far south as Gilroy. So for those listeners, we're going to talk about a hundred miles, Sure. you know, and then, and we're on a, you know, here we're kind of at the bottom of the bay and there's, we're, there's the peninsula there. So yeah. it's. It's not like wide, it's very long. Right. And so it was a fairly concert. And we were testing out at cons- at the end at about 20%. Wow. You know, okay. in terms of positivity uh-huh. um, on the antibody. So, you know, what was going on with the test? What was going on? Think, how much have we learned, no. you know, in this last year? But the point, balance. Yeah, the point was, is like, we were all kind of disappointed. Like, no, oh, man, that was fucking sick. Yeah. Man, yeah. Is, you know, what's up? Well, we, my wife was in Thailand um, the new year and flew home through Shanghai. And then got sick three days later. In 2020. Yeah. 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 And uh, we're like, well, then she had to get in China or, you know, when she was overseas. And uh, yeah, and because um, that's like, that was the, oh, yeah, that was the ground zero. zero. Almost like the epicenter. Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, so we thought for sure, you know, but uh, no, guess not. So we waited until December. Then we all had it. So, yeah. <laughs> so we just passed it around. And then, it, then, it, then yeah. it came or came back. Yeah. You know, not knowing, you know, with the antibody testing then, you know, what we know now was, was it not sensitive enough? Was right. it too sensitive? Yeah. You know, what were we picking up? We were testing for three of the proteins and things like that with the tests that we were running and, and what they know now. But hey, what we know is, uh, you know, it's been a crazy year and yeah. a lot has happened. And uh, that's yeah. part of the reason we, we sort of haven't talked or seen one another. Yeah, no, it's good to see you again. Yeah, you too, see man. The gym's looking awesome. Yeah, thanks. I miss uh, it. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're trying to put the pieces back together. Yeah. It's coming it's come together. You know, we've been back open for a little bit now, and it's it's it, it's starting to feel like a gym again. Yeah. But it is, it is really about trying to evaluate what the new landscape is going to look like and helping the potential customer right. now – deal with kind of the scenario envision yeah, yeah what is the landscape going to look like yeah so in a lot of ways it's it 
nothing's changed, but obviously a lot has changed. Yeah. yeah. We're answering weird questions these days that we weren't, well, not weird, but yeah. weird to us. So no, I'd say they're weird. <laughs> Definitely weird. <laughs> so so uh, let's, I want to get into your background just yeah. a little bit and, and talk about kind of your journey and where, where you, where you were and right. how you got here. But there's, there's a lot of things to touch on here. So first off, there's a, there's a history in bodybuilding right? yeah. and, and competitive bodybuilding and successful at being um, in the, in the bodybuilding world. So we want to talk about that, that. And for those of you that aren't watching or are watching or seeing this, you know, any of this stuff, you, you, you know, it's not hard to tell Bob still, I won't ask him to disclose his age is still built like a brick shit house. <laughs> I hope to look as good as, Oh, Bob thanks. does thanks. in the next two years when I hit that age. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that I'm is. 55 to fill oh, that shit. in. So. Yeah, so. Yeah. But I have so good genetics. All you 55-year-olds, yeah. that Italian blood, baby. There you go. Know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then uh, you're currently a competitive athlete, which we're going to dig into as well. So I compete. Yeah. I don't know how competitive that is, <laughs> but I try. Um, no, the, the bodybuilding, um, I've been lifting weights since I was 14. Mm -hmm. Started in the garage, you know, the Sears plastic coated cement, you know, barbells and yeah. everything. And then got hooked up with gyms probably when I was 15. I would jog a mile to the gym, work out, jog a mile home, whatever it was. And then just got the bug. Never competed until my 30s. Um, I was in Michigan. I think I was doing my residency. Mm -hmm. And one of the trainers at the gold gym said, dude, you should compete. And I'm like, I don't even know what, you know, I know what those guys look like. And he's like, no, that's a different category. And uh, entered my first natural competition, ended up winning the novice, mm -hmm. uh, surprisingly. And then just did that for several years. Realized as a natural bodybuilder, one, you don't make money. Right. I mean, the very, very few. And I wasn't one of those. And it was just a hobby, it was fun. Um, I like to say it kept me clean you know, eating right, taking care of myself mm -hmm. and uh, hit my mid forties and still did natural bodybuilding, which was all drug tested, polygraphed, urine every time you want to show. Right. And kind of got to that point where I got on the, the pro natural stage and looked around and I went, either these guys are really <laughs> genetically gifted or they're getting away with stuff right. and there's no way I can compete. Right. And uh, so just changed gears, you know, and that's when I hit CrossFit. Yeah, I think right around there. Yeah, and so yeah. you, I mean, you've been to the games, right? This no, no, I paid for my ticket and actually gone and sat in the audience. <laughs> I've never competed right, in the game. Country. Yeah, that. no, I've got two so. buddies who at 55, they're both 60 now, okay. they got to the games. Right. Um, so one, I went to see him, Lance, um, the other guy was before I met him. So right. I think that was 2011. Right. And that's when he competed with Craig Howard of Right, yeah, right, right. Cross up, the up the road, just not yep. not too far. Yeah, yeah. So, love what Craig's doing up there with the with the Diablo community. Oh yeah, he's, yeah. he's been great. Yeah. Um, but no, just I went to the games three times to watch. Um, no, I'm you know, I'm a good CrossFitter. I'm not a great CrossFitter. You know, I'm top two hundred, right. maybe top hundred on a good day. That's crazy. But you know, when they're taking the top ten or twenty. You know, I did when I was training here, I went to Wadapalooza. Mm -hmm. That's probably at that point, the second biggest CrossFit event in the world behind the games. Right. And uh, that's where I got the real taste of what an elite athlete looks like. Because mm -hmm. the guys I competed at, I competed with in our 50s, and this is 50 to 54, were phenomenal. Yeah. Just heads and shoulders. Just aliens. Like, okay, oh well, God, yeah. forget it, you know. Yeah, And but thing of, the, the best thing was the fun, the camaraderie, the guys who were there were just fantastic people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost like I give a shit about the events, you know, it's just I want to hang out with you guys. This is fun. Well, that's one thing that CrossFit certainly nailed was the community aspect yep. and bringing people together and they're still doing it. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, the CrossFit's gone through a lot in the last year. There's been a lot, a lot happening and, yeah. you know, from a, you know, without getting too deep into that, um, just even before kind of there was a little bit of, you know, kind of trying to figure out, I think what that model was going to look like, there was, it got a lot harder to compete. The mm -hmm. region, there was regional oh, contests yeah. and there became fewer and fewer of those. And so, yeah. you know, if you were an aspiring CrossFit athlete, it, and you were kind of cutting your teeth and making your way through the, the, the progression mm -hmm. of, okay, what do I have to do to get to the next thing and not actually making it? So got to yep. step back and do the work. And then all of a sudden it really changed. Like, yeah. There was... There was just less opportunity. Yeah, people became professionals, I think is what it came down to. Well, yeah, because it, it was, became monetized, mm -hmm. right? And there was a sponsorship. Ability, yeah, there was everything. ability to make money. And so this kind of this pure, this pureness of the sport then yeah. became a business. Yeah. And um, yeah, 
money, yeah. money ruins everything. Yeah, yeah. The, the way it went. <laughs> but, so, you know, maybe they got to reboot this <laughs> this past year. I like, think so. I, I, yeah, I'm looking at um, I'm looking at what's going on with CrossFit, and yeah. I'm, I'm very I'm very intrigued by this kind of resurgence that I'm mm-hmm. seeing. Um, and my my take on, on it is it comes back stronger than ever. It's going to look different. Yeah, but I think it comes back. I think it comes back stronger than ever. And when I say come back, that might not be very fair. It's not like it went away, right. but it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna resurge, and people are really, yep. especially coming out of this this last year of let's go sedentary lifestyles, right. and, and we're trying to figure it out. People are gonna be looking for an answer, and CrossFit's certainly gonna be mm-hmm. the one that people choose. Yeah. Uh, yep. So let's um, we're, we're gonna come back to this because there's something I want to talk to you about a little bit later, sure. just in terms of. Competing and uh-huh. being okay. whether being competitive or not, that's another story as you've you've already uh, sure. outlined. But so, just in terms of your 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 medical background and mm-hmm. kind of what you do on the day to day here, yeah. Um, t- explain to us and explain to the audience what what is any aging and functional medicine? What is that? Um, one, I don't like the term anti aging, mm-hmm. and it's that's that that's definitely a term thrown around out there because I haven't figured out how to anti age anything. Yeah, right, the time you know the clock ticks. We're all getting older, minute by minute. So, um, you know, originally I kind of thought and age management manage the aging process. Now I think really what I do is longevity medicine. Yeah, I like that word too. You know, it's it's helping people live better longer. And by that, it's preventing chronic disease. And my big five are heart disease, dementia, cancer, diabetes, and osteoporosis. Those are things in the ER during my career. If I saw patients with that, I didn't have any tools to help. It was like, okay, you know, put a Band-Aid on, send you home, admit you to the hospital, let's see what happens. Um, I believe all those are preventable and they're reversible for the most part if we catch them soon enough. Um, so I refocus towards that. So. It's really preventing that stuff. Um, nutrition's a big thing. Exercise is a big thing. Hormone replacement is a big thing. Um, certain, you know, things in the blood that you look for that, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, okay, this is getting out of hand. Let's correct this. Right. Let's try and prevent this. Um, the integrative approach, which is now what I'm board certified in, is really getting to the root cause. You know, it's also thrown around functional medicine. Mm-hmm. Um, it's more looking, okay, what's causing this thing? Let's fix this so we don't get here. Right. Versus, okay, I'm already here, I've got the disease, let's throw a pharmaceutical at it, which sometimes that's called for, mm-hmm. but let's try not to get there. Or if we are already there, let's take type two diabetes. You know, I've had patients with pretty bad type two diabetes on a couple medications. Um, they do the right things, six months, they're not diabetic anymore but they gotta be able to put in the work. Mm -hmm. We're willing to put in the work. They're off pharmaceuticals. They feel better, they lose weight. So you've just reversed that process. And uh, then you stop the damage from being done later down the line. So it's about getting out in front. So absolutely. The the terms we're gonna gonna replace sort of um, Mm anti-aging, functional medicine could be maybe then uh, what I heard you say was longevity Longevity. and more integrative medicine. Correct. Right, so it's not just when we say the term integrative, uh-huh. integrative in my mind means there's lots of things we're going to bring into the right. picture, and it's not necessarily a pharmaceutical exactly. to do the work, mm-hmm. right? Exactly, which is kind of novel almost in a lot of senses. When we look at very Western like. Yeah, we don't we don't really uh, hear about that too much in the yep. modern medical. Yeah, you know. And I again, I was trained in traditional the traditional model. You know, I'm a DO, that's an osteopathic medicine. So I think from the get go, we're trained to look for the cause. And from a musculoskeletal standpoint, try and fix the dysfunction. Um, You know, we're trained in everything else as well. You Mm -hmm. know, um, I rotated through big hospitals all over the place. But then I went to emergency medicine that's run of the mill, that's Western medicine. I mean, and I will say, you know, we do some things in this country great. Emergency medicine's one of them. Critical care, surgery, we're pretty the, awesome. The best in the world, yeah, if in you, you, you get sick, you got trauma, do it here. Right. You need surgery, do it here. You're gonna get shot, you're gonna get in a car accident, do yeah, that yeah, in America. This is the place. A lot of the other stuff, we're just not so hot, you know? Um, again, we're behind uh, the eight ball on a lot of it. We're trying to correct what should have been fixed, not even started breaking. Yeah, I think there's some things to unpack there. Um, no, yeah. I, for sure, we can talk about, I, you know, just sort of going into the the deal 
the mm-hmm. osteopathic medicine, but in, in thinking about, hey, look, at, there's let's fix the problem and you'll fix the disease Correct. kind of approach, yep. right? Yeah. Versus put a Band-Aid on the pro- problem mm-hmm. and let's just, well, potentially you could be exacerbating, well, you might be fixing the symptom, but you're exacerbating something else down Absolutely. the road, which is, mm-hmm. again, some things we could probably see. And then you get back. put on another medication another for that, one. and yeah, you know. Yeah, and so it just kind of this perpetuates itself. Mm-hmm. You know, we're, we're prolonging the, the inevitable. We're not really helping somebody outside of, you know, keeping them to feel the symptoms of whatever right. the problem is. Making numbers look good. Yeah, so when, you know, was it always, when did this become a thing for you? Like, was it all, was it always, do you always know you're going to be a doctor? Oh, hell no. No. <laughs> so no. I got that a high school? life. Um, blind. It was really Just pretty blind. Into yeah. It? it was, got out of high school. Pretty much my dad and I didn't get along well. My parents got divorced right then. So the house was for sale. And uh, my dad basically moved me out um, when I turned 18. And, um, you know, which I wanted at the time. I had started college and just after like six weeks went, I hate this shit. Me. No, yeah. I don't know what I'm doing here. So went to work, ended up managing restaurants for a few years. Oh, wow. You know, and back when you're 19 and 20 and you're, you get this paycheck, it's like, and you're it's at the, the party. World. Right. Oh, it's the yeah. world. And then after a couple of years, you I realized that <laughs> how far is this going to go? Mm-hmm. Nowhere, you know, at least for me. Um, by then I had bought stuff, so I had to pay it off. Right, so it took a liability. couple more years. Mm-hmm. And then when I went back to college, I think I was 24. I mean, I was the biggest fired up college student there was. It was like, I want to take everything. I'm not going to learn everything. Other way. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is awesome. I have no better place to be. And, um, you know, so um, went through that. And really, actually my degree's in English. So I was an English major, creative writing. And um, I thought about that and I'm like, okay, do I want to be a teacher in a liberal arts college somewhere? And you know, that had a little appeal to a certain extent. Um, but my cousin was going to med school and his ro- our roommate, I lived with them at the time. And I think I just one day I thought, you know, gonna probably be a cool thing to do, be a doctor, you know? Um, and it was really the way I looked at it, when I get to the end of my life and if I have the opportunity to look back what did I want that to look like? Uh, okay, it's a good profession, you know? I didn't really get into it for the money. You know, if I, if I did that, I'd have been a cardiologist, mm-hmm. you know, or a surgeon, an orthopedic surgeon. I always got pulled that way, probably because of my size, right. you know? But I loved it, but at the same time, I, I thought I could get locked into this. I could easily see myself spending 16 hours in an OR, losing family, being obsessed, I thought, no, that's not why I got into it, you know? I just think it's a good thing to do, you know? Um, help people. Um, again, I th- still think it's a noble profession for the most part, but it wasn't always, you know, from five years old, I wanted to be a doctor. I had no idea what I wanted to be. And even after high school, after really getting towards college, um, in all those years, it was just one, what, do you, what am I gonna do, you know? So it's kind of like this, you're, you're taking this journey through life, right, and you get to this point. So your, yeah. your roommate's doing it. You, it was kind you, of, pick something hard. Okay, okay I'm, I'm gonna, gonna challenge that. myself. Yeah, right? I'm gonna do that. It, was there any point, you know, in that process where you're like, this was the worst fucking decision of my life? Or was there yeah. a point where the opposite been like, I'm so glad I'm doing this and this, you yeah. know, I'd made, while I may not have known completely, hadn't had that yeah. developed that thought completely, I I have now, and this is this is perfect for me. Yeah, it's probably week three of medical school. <laughs> but what was you the because undergrad was great. Again, I loved it. You know, I had great friends. I enjoy learning. You get to med school, and the you know the cliche is drinking water from a fire hose. Mm-hmm. And you, I you know I got there, and I thought, God, I thought I was smart. I got in here, but I don't know shit. Right. And I can't possibly learn this volume in that short a time, you know? And in three weeks, I think we had our first exams. And I was like, (laughs) there's no way I'm ready, you know? And we all did. I think everybody thought, what did I do? God, you know, my my buddy went into computers and he's already working, you know? Um, So it was just, okay, you're here, dude. Just deal with it, you know? And you just trudge on. And uh, it was almost just endurance. You know, and you just, okay, day to day. What do I have today? What do I have tomorrow? Okay, I'll get through it. Just take the That's step. what it became, you know. Do the work. Part of it was lack of sleep. You know, you get to that point where it's two in the morning, you're studying, you gotta get up at six or 5.30. It's like, how long can I do this? And you just 
kind of have to realize you do it, you know, just don't think about it. Just get up when the alarm goes off, get up and move. You know, that's really what it comes down to. It's like a lot of things in life. Yeah, completely. Right. You know, it's just medical schools teaching you. Uh, and, and I think that's way. part of why we compete as well. You know, get you out of your kind of comfort zone, zone, your, your normal training. What can I do to make right. this more difficult and challenging? You know, um, but yeah, it was probably third week of med school where I was like, what the <laughs> so, so <laughs> idea was this? Yeah, and you chose, interestingly, you chose osteopathic medicine, right? You, you went that route, yeah. not MD, and I think it's important to, yeah. to talk about, for those that maybe don't know, what's the difference in the pathway and why did you why did you choose osteopathic medicine? Because, to my knowledge, because it chose me, <laughs> to put it that way. And uh, I, it, can be, it, can, it seems harder. I think you can probably in my class ninety percent of the people. It's because we didn't get into an MD school. Uh, I'll be blunt there, completely right. honest. You know, this was the alternative. Um, yeah, it was. This was second prize, and I didn't know to begin with. I kind of heard, but never really looked into it. Um, and then. It was my cousin who I was living with. He ended up going to UC, Ir UC Irvine Med School. His wife at the time went to the school I went to. And I was having dinner with them one night and I was talking with both of them. And I asked her, I'm like, I really like what you're doing, you know? And she explained what the difference was, which really we already kind of hit on that. Let's look at causes first, try and fix those before we get to the next step. Um, but she also said the DO school was probably harder because it's the same curriculum as an allopathic or an MD school. But then we had one to two hours of manual medicine, osteopathic concepts afterwards. So our days were very long. Um, and you know, you can loosely link that to chiropractics, although okay. it's not, sure. um, but if to give some, to give people something, uh, a lot more like, hands on completely, lab, completely. Kind of, yeah. Like it's taking a lap. Yeah, right. Absolutely. And, uh, it just seemed a better fit. Um, so I can honestly, my best friend in med school didn't make it in two years in a row. Finally applied to osteopathic med school. Third year he got in, mm -hmm. you know, one of the, the, probably the, one of the best doctors I've ever seen, you know, and it's for a lot of, you know, for him, he just didn't take a, a standardized test that well. Okay. He yeah. could talk to you about everything all day. I, can, I mean, he's I can relate. highly intelligent, but when it came to, you know, filling in the bubble, just wasn't a good test taker. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a lot of us, it just picked us. Gotcha. You know? And I honestly have no regrets um, at all. You know, we had a tight class. We had a lot of great people, you know, and I trained along MDs, worked with them. There's good ones there. There's bad like EOs. Like anything, right? You yeah. know, it's right. just exactly. You know, find, find the good and, good and the bad. In fact, the ER I worked at up in Reading uh, for eight years, uh, we had 16 people in our group. I think six of us were DOs. And to walk in and see one of us, you would know the MDs from the DOs, you know. Any idea what the percentage is of DOs versus MDs and kind of how it exists maybe in the U.S. or I don't know, yeah, if you know, like locally? or I don't. For sure, it's it's small, just by virtue of the number of schools. You mean do you mean DOs to MDs? Yeah, just it's a small number, a small percentage of DOs. Um, just by virtue of schools, and there's far fewer. There's a lot more MD schools. Yep. If you go, because I trained in Michigan, um, Detroit area, our hospital it was a DO hospital. Um, I, we may have had three MDs on staff. Wow. But it was a regular hospital. I mm. mean, you wouldn't, you know, Botsford General Hospital is just ambulance came in. That's where they brought you. Um, it was just heavily weighted there. So in terms of practice mm. and your experience, um, you know, again, you sort of compared and contrasted you yeah. know, what the DO does versus what the MD or goes through with this from a school or an education perspective mm -hmm. versus what the MD goes through. Any, did you ever even in maybe in your residency, in your practice and in your experiences, did you have you ever run into conflicts in terms of patient care and how to do no, things? No. So there's not like a no, there's not like, oh, I have this piece of paper on the wall and you have this piece of paper. No. So my, my way is better than yours. I didn't. I never did um, at all. And I did trauma surgery at USC. I did ER at USC and um, never. You know, I didn't have that. I've heard of it happening, but maybe it's you know, because your size too. I thought that I didn't think that had something to do with it. Um, but you know, it's just you go in, you work, you do your thing. Right. What's you know, like, where's the criticism coming? Yeah, from? I guess I'm going to yeah. like um, you know, as we're looking into where we're at as a nation. Mm -hmm. and again, 
peel back some layers of the onion right now and you know what might be more beneficial for the collective us and our collective health yeah um and what may have been or maybe better and where we need to go the approach to fix the problem Mm -hmm. fix the disease um it seems to me we've created a massive problem big time by not Fixing the problem, mm-hmm. and now we're riddled with disease. And you named your top was it six? Top five. Top yeah. five. I'm sure you could throw in the yeah, several, several, yeah. several more. The metabolic disorders that, that exist out there that sure. are killers. I mean, yep. still with with uh, it, tragically with all the people um, that we're, we're counting as COVID deaths and whatever. Mm-hmm. Still over six hundred thousand people a year die in the United States alone from heart attack. Mm-hmm. Still, still the number, still one, number one, killer. one killer. Still yeah. the number one killer. Yeah. Um, and again, while some people are afflicted with some hereditary, you know, things that they might might mm-hmm. yeah. might be subjected to, right. pre- predisposed to. Mm-hmm. Bottom line is, heart disease is yeah. I mean, preventable. You know, great point. I mean, we're behind on this. You know, why did so many people get sick? So many people die. And poor health. You know, I really think that's at the crux of everything. Um, British Journal of Sports Science, I think yesterday published online, people less physical active, physically active, and this was like 48,000 people that they went back through. Um, less physical activity, far more mortality mm-hmm. and morbidity. And you know, what are the top risk factors with COVID-19? Obesity and type two diabetes. You know, you can throw age in there, but none of us can change that. Right. So, and I've had plenty of healthy 70 and 80 years old, 80 year olds, catch it and like, ah, whatever, you know, it was annoying, but that was about it. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was about it. You know, I had a, I think he was 72 years old. He only tested himself because his daughter was positive and he he was like, I was positive. He wanted to know fine, you know? Yeah. Yeah, It's like, I should test myself, I guess. But if we were a healthier country and we've known the obesity epidemic forever for, for decades, the diabetes epidemic for decades, and, you know, again, we just really, maybe there's been some effort to fix it, but not enough, obviously, you know, and that would have prevented a lot of mortality, a lot of morbidity. Yeah, I just, um, I, I guess kind of in the, in the bigger picture, mm-hmm. we have this, this nation now that's maybe starting to wake up to this. I, maybe I they're so. starting. I yeah. mean, the, the narrative is changing a little bit. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're hearing definitely more about, hey, like this obesity thing, it's a thing. You mm-hmm. know, like it matters. It matters a lot yeah. in, in this case. Maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe we don't want to admit that it matters a lot in other cases, but mm-hmm. it definitely matters in this case. Sure. Hey, you know, poor micronutrient levels, those are, those are, seem to be factors. Pretty damn important. Yeah, real. Mm-hmm. And, there, I think that the truth continues to, to come forward. And again, not that, you know, people are spitting on truths. It's just, we're not really, yep. we haven't been hearing it till now. Yeah. And so you've got, you know, people that are maybe like listening, maybe, mm-hmm. um, I don't know. I, yeah. I hope that should be the loudest thing out there is that? health matters. Yeah. You know, it really does. And I don't think people understand that until they're not healthy is what I've seen in my, my experience where it really hits them. They're, they're laid up somehow, or all of a sudden they're on a handful of medications like, oh, okay, you know, this sucks. Now I get it. You right. know? But then again, I think it's statistics are somebody has a heart attack, a third of the people change their, their behaviors, a third of them do for a little bit, and then they go back, and a third never do. And they just so, they rely on the medication or the system yeah. or whatever to take yeah. care of them. Well, I've already had this happen. I mean, I'll just live how I was. That's, you know? that's that. Yeah, that's versus a guy, I saw this uh, yesterday morning. Um, pushing 80, heart attack, oh, 15, 20 years ago. Defibrillator now realized he wasn't taking care of himself. And uh, he cleaned everything up, lost weight, became not diabetic. He's the happiest guy in the world. Right. I, you know, every time I see him, he's like, everything's awesome. I'm doing great. I'm fantastic. So it's doable. Completely. Right? It's, not, completely. it's not an impossible task, right? Yeah. It just uh-huh. means you got to do the work. And you've mentioned a little bit it's about The whole that. thing when we started that is, you know, a guy had hemoglobin A1C 10.5, you know, under 5.7 to 6.4 is that pre-diabetic range, mm-hmm. which I don't believe in, you know, being pre-diabetic is kind of like kind of being pregnant. You either are or you're not. The damage is being done or it's not. Right. You just so, haven't tipped the scale yet. Yeah. And 6.4 and above is 
you know, technically type two diabetes or diabetes. And he was at 10, five. And I told him what to do. And he was a dude who looked me in the eye and he said, I'll do exactly what you tell me to do, which I've heard, I don't know how many times. In six months, it was 5.5 off medications. He had lost 120 pounds. He did the work, you know? And this is a guy who is successful, but sacrificed health for success for a long time. And then realized, oh, this is gonna work against me pretty soon here. There was this trade, you know, right? Yeah. yeah. Trading, trading life for mm-hmm. a paycheck, yep. you know, or, or whatever a feeling uh-huh. or chasing, chasing. Yeah. So you, you have to be willing to put the work in, you know, and when I say work, I mean, that sounds so harsh, right? You know, it's just changing diet, which again, it's a bitch. It's a tough thing to do. It's not easy, but it works. Right. You got to do it. <laughs> so I, I imagine, I, well, I guess what I want to learn yeah. about is, so you were in emergency medicine. Yeah. Right, and you're seeing some things. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> things I never thought existed. <laughs> oh, yeah, like what? Oh, you, you, it's run of the mill stuff, heart attacks, strokes, you know, traumas, broken bones, lacerations, surgical cases. Um, I don't know, it's just, it opens your eyes, you know? I can't think of anything offhand right. that, um, well, I can, but you know. Just things, when you think you've seen it all, you Yeah, see it's like human thing. nature will fool you. It's like, oh, I didn't know we could do that. It's like, okay, to ourselves, I guess that could mean? happen. Yeah, yeah. you know. Uh, hey, I, one of my favorite stories, I think, was a guy who came in and he had a BB in his hand. Okay. And you're like, yeah, I need a B. I shot myself. I'm like, how? Well, I had my BB gun and I wanted to know if it was loaded. So I put my hand out and yeah, it's, the BB's in there. So we do an x-ray and there's two BBs in there. And he said, well, I thought, you know, you do this once. He goes, oh no, I did that a while back. It's the first one. Second time. Yes, this is the second time. Holy God. I mean, just crazy stuff that is like, okay, well, I get, all right. I guess people, human nature will fool you. So here you go, you go to medical school. So now do I dig out two BBs? Right. (laughs) Because I only have one entrance wound. (laughs) So yeah, you're in there. Yeah, right. So, you know, uh, just, you know, but you see a lot of tragedy. That was the hard part, you know. Um, It's all true, you know, because lives change. Can change like that right there in front yep. of you, yeah. And you're dealing with the aftermath, or mm-hmm. you have to move on to the next thing. Yep. Well, you got to be able to drop it, move on to the next room, yeah. So, I can't imagine. I mean, so here's a personal disclose I spent more time in the ER than I think and my mother was a nurse for you know <laughs> 40 years, uh-huh. right? Uh, I spent a good part of my childhood in the ER, I was on a first name basis. Okay, what about, side of the bed were so, you on? Yeah, 12 years old to about. 17, 18 years old. Uh-huh. I was in the in emergency room a couple times a year uh-huh. or whatever. I was just, was, boys will be boys. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it was it was for things. I was out being active. I yeah. was playing, I was falling down, mm-hmm. breaking bones and spraining things, dislocating yeah. things, you know, getting cuts that needed stitches and, and you know, just those kinds of things. I wasn't right. wasn't making poor life choices. Right. right. I was just kind of doing being that Being a stuff. kid. Yeah. yeah, and I remember being handled really well. Every yeah, that's time. all good. Every, you know? every time when I came in. I can't imagine, though, what it's like to be on the other side and you have this kid who's been out playing or whatever and he's mm-hmm. falling off his bike and he's broken his arm or, you know, in my case, I was jumping off barns or yeah. you know, things like yeah. that <laughs> and breaking arms. Yeah. The second, the first time I broke a foot, the second <laughs> yeah. time I broke my arm, it wasn't PV. I so. know I can fly this Yeah, time. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we're going to give it a shot anyways. But going in and then in the other just only separated by a curtain is somebody there that's just not taking care of themselves their whole life and they have their family standing around where I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to get, you know, a reduction in this, in this break or whatever. And I'm, I'm going to get a cast. I'm going to walk out of here and I'm going to be sore for a few days and in eight weeks, I'm going to get this cast off and I'm going to be right back to the same biker barn, you know, I fell off of, but this person over here has got this whole family around them that's going to watch them because they're going to pump them full of drugs. Yeah. They're going to put them on all kinds of machines. And this family is essentially going to watch this person continue to die, Mm -hmm. right, over however long a period that modern medicine can keep Keep them them going, going, yeah, right, or in however long the body and this person decide to fight. Is it that kind of thing that had you make the switch from emergency medicine into what you're doing now? That was a lot of it. And I've told this to several people. When I started my career in emergency medicine, if I saw 20 patients in a shift, 19 needed to be there. There There's one that just maybe poor life choices. Maybe they bounced back. They're there every week. Maybe, you know, we always throw this term out, drug seeking. 
the truth is most people go into the ER are seeking drugs of some sort, it, antibiotic, painkillers, whatever. Right. Something so, to fix the problem. We, exactly, mm -hmm. and legitimately. Right. Um, but it was more the narcotic seekers, which, you know, whether they got a prescription, took it themselves, or sold it on the street, who knows. But it was about 19 to one in the beginning of my career. When I ended up leaving, it was flipped. It was like I'd, I'd leave a shift and go, God, I, I really took care of one person who needed to be here wow. on that shift. 19, it was you know, real soft calls. It was either what I just explained, poor life choices, God, that guy's in here every other day um, or what have you, you know? And then it was the frustration of not being able to fix stuff, you know? I think my personality is such that you know, my wife tells me this, I need to fix things. You know, where she says, you know, we need to talk about this. I'm like, well, let, I got to fix it. What do we, what's wrong? And she's like, no, no, no. I just need you to, I need you to listen. <laughs> just listen to me. But both. just tell me what to fix. I can do that. Um, and, you know, like the chronic five that I talked about, couldn't do that in the ER, you know, set a bone, um, reduce the dislocation. I can do that. I can fix that. Um, but it just got too heavily weighted the other way. Wow. You know? How frustrating. You know, it, it wasn't. <laughs> It was because I did it longer than I wanted to. Mm -hmm. So I think we had talked that, well, you'd ask, how did I transition, mm -hmm. you know? And I was full partner of our group at that time, decent paycheck, I'm finally making some money. And, you know, I go home to my wife and I'm like, I don't think I can do this anymore. You know, I have an awesome wife who said, okay, but what are we gonna do? She's, I'm like, what? She says, we've been poor before. We, you know, we can be poor again, we're fine. So um, I retrained, you know, and it took me a few years to get out. And I uh, actually, in the interim, got uh, certified in wound care and hyperbaric medicine. So I did that for a few years along with ER and building my practice. Um, just because I had some friends who were ex-ER docs who owned a wound care center. Mm -hmm. They're like, yeah, dude, come work with us. So um, it was, you know, frustration with all that, um, but also reevaluating why I got into well, yeah, medicine. Yeah, I was just gonna say, it completely just, you're doing something completely different than what you just explained yeah. to me you wanted to do and look back on and say yeah. I did this. Yeah, because also I have what I call occupational ADD, which ER sets up perfectly for that. Because, <laughs> you know, I mentioned, you know, if I wanted to make a big paycheck, cardiology or, you know, interventional cardiology, all, that, all day, every day, right. I mean, that's great for that person who can do it. Right. And, you know, excel and I'll get bored, uh, you know. I've heard it explained, you know, in emergency medicine, well, let's say cardiology, right. you gotta know this much. Mm -hmm. Obstetrics, gynecology, you gotta know this much. Pediatrics, this much. Surgery, orthopedics, or you're doing, on. You're, you're dealing with the same yeah. things and the same genre ER, every day. ER, you gotta know this much on all of those. Everything, yeah. So it's always changing and, you, you know, you can sew up a kid in one room, treat a heart attack in the next, and it's different, you know, which is appealing because short attention span, get bored. Um, then I got to a point where it's just, okay, you know, done with it, you know. I gotta move on to something else, what's next? I wonder how, I wanna get into that, but yeah. I wonder how just in the transition and you as a doctor of anything anymore, uh -huh. right? Working in, in medicine, again, we have already kind of touched on how unhealthy or we are collectively. Our country is, yeah. yeah. it's it's really rough. It's a rough well, spot. That's the world. Yeah, but doctors are in a tough spot. Yeah. I mean, no, have, I don't envy them. We have way more, way more sick people than we have doctors. Mm -hmm. um, we have way more, you know, medicine that we can throw at them than we've ever had. The insurance business now really dictates what a doctor can and can't do to a certain extent, yeah. or maybe more than a certain extent to a very large extent. Yeah. And you're sitting there and you're trying to do the right thing and you're you're thinking back to, I put in all this work to medical school, I got into this profession for this reason, and this is not really what I signed up for. Exactly, and that changed about halfway through my career. So halfway through. Yeah, the geography changed. And even taking that a, a step further, I still have people who work in hospitals, um, actually a fair number of my patients, especially up in Reading where I live, still work in the hospitals. It's now being more protocol driven where they're not allowed to do outside of what this protocol is. We were talking about vitamin D and COVID. Okay, the, the, the research behind vitamin D and, and immunity and helping it's prevent massive. severe right. is just, I mean, it's, it's you can't unbelievably really argue it. good. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And some of the docs in our local hospital wanted to implement a vitamin D protocol and administration said, no, turned it down. 
I'm like, whoa, whoa, <laughs> who tells them what to do? You're a physician, you make up your own mind. How does that work now? So I don't get it. You know, it's just, it's switched to being protocols. Yeah, can you give us another example? So I love that one, and I wanna talk a little bit more about vitamin D, but, yeah. but because it is a hot topic, right? Yeah, People sure. are hearing about it finally. Again, this is part of the narrative that's changing. Again, I don't get. Yeah, and here we are. It's not like it's the first time we've heard about it. Yeah. But let's go back to those protocols. And I was mm -hmm. kind of, I was again talking about insurance and what it tells you you can and <laughs> can't do. Yeah. So somebody comes in, I mean, give me an example of somebody coming in where you're looking at it going, I know this person needs this kind of care, this kind of treatment, in this kind of order, in this kind of way, but I can't. I can't mm -hmm. do it because why? Yeah. Well, remember, I've been out of ER for seven years now. Protocols had just started kind of being put in there. Okay. So I don't have a good answer on that because I just don't have the experience. Right. Because you, you got out. Right. But a problem I had to begin with was, let's say, chest pain. OK. One of the most common complaints people come into the ER. They instituted a protocol where somebody comes in triage in the front and they are complaining of chest pain. They automatically get an EKG doesn't matter if they're 19 years old and they got hit in the chest with a baseball bat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They get an EKG, right. you know, or, you know, they, they have a cut or something. It's chest pain. So they get an EKG. And then I get these EKGs on healthy 19 year olds. We know it's not the heart. I'm like, what, what, the fuck, what right. do I do with this? Right. Okay. They're going to get billed for it. Right. That's the next, that's the next point. Yeah, exactly. For my interpretation, the uh, cardiologist interprets all down, down the road. Um, and it just got kind of ridiculous. It's like, okay, I get, you know, somebody who's in their sixties with a history comes in sweaty and it's pretty obvious. Well, one, get them back do the EKG. I mean, right. that's, that's pretty, but you, you just get kind of wasted stuff. And I think that I saw that at the beginning. I'm like, I just, I'm, I'm against that. You know, it meant to expedite things. Mm -hmm. That's what it was for. But I think it in large part, it caused more problems than it was worth. So I can kind of look back and maybe that was the beginning of the, the protocols okay. and algorithms, but I got out before then. Got it. Fortunately. <laughs> so if we're looking at that, then we've got, um, Health insurance, mm -hmm. right? Starting to play a huge role, right? Health, uh, yeah. And, and then you've got health, you got the management of the hospital, mm -hmm. you know, the ER, whatever facility, whatever, you know, type of institution you're working for, whatever. Then you get a doctor, right? Mm -hmm. And they need to make their money and they need to do their thing. And then you got the patient on the back end who's feeling all this. Yeah. Right? From a from a cost perspective. Oh yeah. So then things start to shift. Mm -hmm. Right? Then well well, people can't afford health care. Well, it's not that they can't afford health care. Yeah. They can't afford what you're charging right, them, right? Completely. So now you make them dependent mm -hmm. on having health care. Yep. And now they're caught in a system where and that, that's dictating how much things should cost. Things yeah. start to grow exponentially. And then you go, so you go to the ER for, for a broken arm and you wind up with a $300,000 right. medical <laughs> bill. And to my knowledge, still, um, Medical bankruptcy is still the number one cause of homelessness, I think, in the really? United States. Yeah, okay, I wouldn't doubt it. I, I, yeah. I could be wrong. Yeah. I, I could be wrong on that, but it is yeah. a it, it's one of the major reasons mm -hmm. people wind up bankrupt is because they can't afford their medical responsible medical people. Bill. Yeah, I yeah. see that. So here we are, and you're <laughs> you're now going. I can't do this anymore, mm -hmm. Laura, who I met by the way, yeah. who's a badass in her own yeah. right. Yeah, <laughs> yep. um, she says, okay, we can do this. And so yep. you go and you're, you're working in this wound care clinic and so forth and other opportunities come up. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of leads us into where you're at now. Yeah. And then why don't you tell us about that? It was almost happenstance. Cause I think it was in my mid forties, early forties at the time. And I just started feeling worn. And I was talking with a patient earlier about this today. This thing hit me that I'd never experienced. It was this tightness in the chest, this worried feeling going okay. to work. And at one point I went, I'm anxious. What the hell is this? I'm not an anxious person, I'm pretty mellow. And uh, you know, was that a drop in testosterone? I think it was at the time. Um, a lot of it was also like, you know, wanting to transition or get out. So I actually went to my first anti-aging conference, which is what it was called. Um, 2008, 2007. How old are you at this point? Um, oh, early 40s, Okay, I think. Yeah, and it was selfish. And, I mean, really, a lot of this is selfish, you know, because, you know, who are you going to treat first, usually? Yourself. Right. Okay. I don't want to get chronic disease. 
I want to be healthy as long as I can. I yeah, want to live a long time. There you go. So, Good stuff. You know, so, okay. I started this. I went to an anti-aging conference in uh, Las Vegas. And there were maybe 200 of us, I think. And just listening, I mean, one, the physicians were the smartest people I've ever met. Um, several of them were ex-ER physicians okay. who hit, you know, one lady, Pam Smith, who's kind of taught most of this, this stuff. She said for her, she hit menopause. She was working in the ER and she'd go home and she couldn't sleep. And she's hot flashes, night sweat. She's like, this is the kiss of death. I got to fix this. Mm -hmm. So she trained herself and um, became the mentor for a lot of us. But the, the conference I went, there's a small number of people. And I went, okay, this isn't bullshit. These people are really freaking This smart. is the group I want to be. These be people, are, this yeah. is all research okay. driven. They, they had the references, they're well-spoken, they know what they're doing, and they've done other things, you know? Um, and I came away going, okay, this is what I wanna do. This is what I'm supposed to do, mm. you know? And ended up doing a fellowship, which I did in a year. And back then we didn't have online anything. Um, I mean, there was online stuff, but it was no, you couldn't do online learning. So I had to fly. I think every month I flew to a different city Wow! Um, to get my fellowship done. Yeah. I think I did it in a year, um, but places like Houston, Florida, Washington, D.C., Detroit. Uh, oh, that's not like, that's not like flying to no, Nevada. No, or nothing was on the West Coast. Yeah. Nothing was on the West Coast. Okay. Vegas was our, is our main conference. It still is every December, and that's obviously towards the West Coast. Yep. Everything else is back East. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it took just over a year to do that. Took my boards with that and, uh, you know, got certified or whatever. So uh, what are the things you're getting certified in? What are you learning about this just blowing your mind? And um, A different way of looking at things. You know, hormones, honestly, were not taught a whole lot okay. throughout, you hormones. know. Insulin, that's about it, you know. Um, you know, thyroid to a certain extent, but not the other stuff. Um, I think you ask many uh, gynecologists, all they know about hormones, birth control. That's the ones I, I meet and talk with, and there's several in our group, that's all they knew, you know. They didn't know the intricacies of them, certainly not testosterone. Um, so it was just a new way of looking at stuff. It's like, why didn't anybody ever tell us this? It's not like it's not there. It's a good question, it's Bob. Why in, weren't they? Exactly. Um, well, I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, and I think in the last 10 years, it's coming more to light, but it's still not there. Still not. It's it's more of a, you know, look down upon thing for the, for the most part. A little I think. taboo. Yeah. Outside the box kind of stuff, which I'm totally cool with because I don't really have a box. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I mean, look at it. Chinese medicine. It's been around for a couple thousand years. Right. If it didn't work, I think it would have gone it away by now. Yeah. Ayurvedic medicine, same deal, probably even longer. Couldn't it would have more. gone away. So right. we can't blow those things up. Oh, the herbs don't work. Okay. Yeah. No, there's actually a lot of scientific research, a lot of exactly. documented studies that didn't mm -hmm. have support great everything. outcomes and support yep. all of it. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I mean, and again, studies are studies, and you can find another yep. study that's going to refute the other study. But sure. There's enough now. Mm -hmm. where you know, not the panacea, but then again, no drug is. Correct. You know, pharmaceutical or otherwise. Right. Uh, but it was really, you know, just looking at the different organ systems in a different way. You know, how can we improve this? How can we stop inflammation? That was really the first time I heard inflammation and not just, yeah, I, you know. Yeah, from uh, a sprain I, or a right, break. You or know, I worked out too hard. I played tennis. My elbow hurts. Right. It's like, what do you mean inflammation in the heart? Well, it means your blood vessels are being poorly treated. They're pissed off. So they release things to act out and they're not good. You know, in an acute thing, sense, that's what protects you. But chronically, that leads to disease, that's bad. you know. Um, so it was really where I was introduced to that. And it was just interesting. I would bring some of this stuff back. Probiotics is a great example. Okay. Who doesn't know probiotics now? At this point. It's, yeah. it's tough to find anybody. It's who, on every grocery store shelf. and All over the place, right. right? It's at the convenience store. So when I learned that, oh, 2010, I want to say 10 years ago, it's just, you know, I was going, okay, bacteria, what, huh? And I went back to my hospital, spoke to an internist who I really respected. I really liked her about this. She's like, you're eating bacteria. Right. Where do you get this stuff? You know? And she, it was kind of put to me like, is this some dude in his it's garage blue, chemistry? Blue. Yeah. It's it just really came from a gastroenterologist at Harvard. That's where it all started. Right. And uh, I'm like, no, this is in it. 
you know, now I think when they admit people to the hospital, they're putting on probiotics right. and it's just expanded. But back then it was like, what the fuck are you talking right. about? You give, if you give somebody an antibiotic, you're probably giving them a probiotic, right? Yeah. So that they Hopefully. can recover because you give them an antibiotic that kills the bad stuff. It's also killing the good stuff. Hopefully. And that's why when you take antibiotics, a lot of times you spend three or four days in the, in the yeah. restroom, 10 or more times than you uh-huh. want to be. So yeah. the probiotic helped balance it back out. Yeah. Case in point. So I uh, talked to a lady yesterday. She's been a patient for probably eight years. Last time I talked to her, frequent urinary tract infections. You know, she's menopausal um, every other week. She's constantly on antibiotics, you know. Are you on a probiotic? No. Okay, take this one. So this is what the MD is throwing at her? Oh, antibiotics. Right, all yeah. the time. There's yeah. fix the problem. Mm-hmm. And I talked to her yesterday. Have you had any UTIs? Not since I started it. None. Gone away. You know, the simple fix. So just balancing the ecosystem. Populating the bacteria with the, the yeast in the area. And yeah, you know. So so let's get into this. So <laughs> in, in terms of what you do and, and mm-hmm. who you work with and, and how this all works. So um, a, it's a little personal story. I in how I got introduced to you mm-hmm. is that I was nearing my 40s. Uh-huh. And I had the same kind of weird start feelings started happening. I started... Yeah experiencing some some symptoms yeah. that I knew weren't right. Unusual. And this was coming off of a time in my life where my business was growing. Mm-hmm. Um, I was training very hard um, to, to compete athletically. Right. Uh, I was working out a lot, right? And my, my, my probably under eating, you know. Sure. Grossly under eating, but to some people it would look like, how can that be under yeah. eating? Right. But to me, I was probably a little imbalanced because I was working so much and training so much, three hours, sometimes four hours a day training, doing what I was doing, yeah. right? At the same time, I mean, some of the bigger things that I didn't credit at the time and I was ignoring and putting in a box was I was going through a divorce. Mm-hmm. Um, it was hugely stressful, Stress. oh, right? There's yeah. financial stuff, there's emotional stuff, there's kids, sure. there's property and assets and all the things that go into that. And, um, it was a very, very stressful time. And all of a sudden I started, I started having some symptoms. Yeah. Um, weirdly I was, I was getting this rash, like, and I was like heat and cold sensitive all of a sudden, like mm-hmm. I would and break out in hives. And that was really weird. I was like, well, what's, what is going on with that? Like, and then I was noticing I was having temperature control issues. Mm-hmm. Um, hot flashes to a certain right. extent, night sweats were happening. I was like, I've never had this shit before. What is yeah, going on? Yeah. I had zero libido. Uh-huh. I had zero interest right. in, in, in anything from that, from that perspective. Now you know things are really now, weird. Exactly. So yeah. I'm again, so there's a guy who's working out constantly, yeah. right? He's, he's eating pretty well for, you know, by most standards, probably not enough, but eating, mm-hmm. He'd been, I've been in health and fitness my entire life. You know, I'm trying to back load and, and, and everything that, you know, that I needed to do to, to keep myself healthy. And here I am with these symptoms at 38 years old and I'm going, something's wrong. Yeah. And so I, the first step that I took was, all right, well, you know, I got to fix this, right? Of course. So, uh-huh. so um, what do I do? And I, mind you, I never go to the doctor. The only time I go to the doctor is the emergency room if I have an emergency. So I don't have an MD to go to. I don't have anybody to really look up, but I do some research and I'm convinced I've got some kind of some thyroid issue Mm -hmm. going on. And and I started to maybe credit the stress a little bit. And so the first thing I do is I start to call, you know, my mom who's connected in the medical field. I want to see an endocrinologist. I want somebody that can dig into what's going on with me, potentially Mm -hmm. hormonally and chemically. So you want to pass go and go right there. Right. I was yeah. just fucking, let's find yeah. out. I want the answer and I want it yeah. now, right? Yeah. I want to know, do I need to do something different? Right. And I, you know, whatever. So I schedule, you know, I do some research and I schedule an appointment. I get in and um, I'm given some, I'm given some blood tests and urine tests and I come back and I get this blood test back and I'm, I'm sure I'm going to have answers, right? Yeah, no. Well, first off, walking to the office, like, I got some funny looks because, you know, I'm, I'm a big guy, right. right? And, you know, and I'm... What's he doing? What's he... <laughs> exactly. Yes. The, the first thing that happened was I went in and they tried to put, like, a baby arm or blood pressure cuff on me. So when I walked in, they're like, your blood pressure is really high. I'm like, that's for an infant. Yeah. I'm a grown person. <laughs> like, can we redo it again? Yeah. Right? Because, oh, you're right. So we put another one on it and it was fine. So then yeah. I go on, I'm like, oh, this is not getting off to a good start. And, we'll, and then next thing I know, I've gone through the blood test and I'm having the consultation with the doctor. And he's, uh, he's asking me some, some questions. He's like, so what kind of supplements are you taking? And I'm like, man, I, I have a protein powder that I use. Interesting question. Right? Yeah. And occasionally 
I use like a pre-workout type mm-hmm. of thing to, but and I had been doing that because I couldn't get up for my workouts. Oh, yeah. So that was, a, that was new for me. Yeah. So I was throwing in, you know, this beta alanine and, you know, arginine and things like that and with the caffeine. And I was just trying to get up for my workouts so, because I wasn't feeling good. Right. I, didn't, I was losing the, the drive to do that. And he's like, okay. And so he starts going through my blood tests. Right. And, you know, I, I immediately want to hone in on the first things like, what does the thyroid panel say? What does the t- t- testosterone panel say? Mm-hmm. Well, the first thing he, he says is, well, I think there may be something in your supplements. Are you sure that's all you're doing? And I was like, dude, <laughs> like I hear where you're, I've yeah, been going very. through this my entire life. Yeah. Like, it, 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 you know, no, I'm not doing any uh-huh. steroids. I'm not doing anything illicit. There's nothing going on in the back end right. here. I'm, I'm telling you. This is, this, I'm giving you everything I, I got. I want answers. So anyway, long story short, he starts going through, well, see, your, your thyroid's normal. Well, what I recognize is all he ran was a TSH panel. Yeah. You're, you're fine. Your thyroid's mm-hmm. fine. At the time, I was like, okay, I'm taking that as an answer. But then he gets to the testosterone level and he says, well, you're, you're, and you're normal here. Well, on this particular scale, my, my testosterone was like, an, it was like 136. Right on Ooh. on this particular thing. yeah yeah mm-hmm. and so I'm going well that doesn't seem right right and I'm and but he's saying I'm normal because because I'm not flagging yeah. below the reference range the reference range right. was like 135 yeah right like I am so low all uh-huh. right and then the next point was is I, now I get into the estrogen levels and the estro the estradiol level was like towards the top mark, uh-huh. top of the marker, but not quite flagging right. over the top. And he goes, so you're actually fine, but this this could be, you know, so what this looks like to me is you might be having an allergy to something, you know, with the hives and whatever. And so I walk out of there with a with a, ref, a referral to a um, allergist. An allergist. Okay. So then I go and I sit down in the allergist's office, and they put a hundred pins in my back, right? They do a. Oh, I know that well. Yeah. They do the whole. Had it as a kid. <laughs> right. So I, I I go through all that, and do I? And what happens? Oh, you're, you're you know good. you don't have any you don't have yeah. any allergies. Then now I'm taking in all this information. And I'm dealing with it. I'm I'm telling the story because. This is something we deal with here at Red Dot Fitness mm-hmm. quite often, and this is it's what I see. All this the is time. why we refer to <laughs> Doctor Bob all the time, is because now I've gone through this. So the next the next step is is like, well, I know my testosterone's fucked. Yeah, I'm not really sure what's going on with my thyroid, but I didn't understand quite understand the the dynamic there. Now I understand this is not right. Well, I need testosterone because mm-hmm. this is a problem. Yeah. So how do I get that? Well, I knew enough people that I can make some phone calls and <laughs> right. probably get some. But I didn't want to do it that way right. because I don't need it mixed in somebody's garage right. and then wind up in me, you know, or whatever. I didn't want to go that way. And I, I wanted help. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to try to, at this point, I didn't want to try to do it on my own. I want to do this legitimately. So yeah. I make some more phone calls and I get hooked up with the urologist. I remember. Yeah. So I go to the urologist and the urologist says, okay, we're going to run some blood tests. I go through the whole thing again. He goes, yep, your definitely test is definitely low. Okay. And so here's what we're going to do. He goes, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to put you on the gel. Right. Mm-hmm. And you're going to try that. We're going to do that for 30 days. Um, and then after that, the options are you could go to some injections or you mm-hmm. could go to pellets. Right. And then, yeah. yeah. So I do the gel. I go, OK, so we come back from the gel. Well, immediately going on the gel, I'm feeling worse within about a okay. week. I'm feeling worse. I take the blood test after about three weeks of this. I come back. My my estrogen is at the level of a 16 year old girl yeah right <laughs> and my testosterone level is not budged yeah right it's only made so just converted pr- everything he's just thrown shit at the wall yeah. right it, it essentially and made it made my situation and now i'm like i'm getting upset yeah like and this isn't helping my overall problem as i'm learning right so then it's like well here's your options and and, and ultimately i'd gone to testosterone pellets yeah i remember yeah and yeah. the long story short on that was is it, there was more throwing shit at the wall mm-hmm. and without without understanding or without a full awareness of what my entire condition was yeah and it didn't make it better and made it worse. And right. I went through all kinds of things before I finally made it into your office. Right. And I, th- I share that story because I think it's very typical. Absolutely. And, you know, I've got one to tag on there, which is a personal story. Also, before I started this, when I did natural bodybuilding, my last round of shows, I think I was 43, 44, somewhere in there. So it was, you know, I was making the step onto the pro natural body bodybuilding stage. And... 
I got to a point where I was working in the ER, and this is this is eight months of dieting for these shows. Right. You know, it's all drug free. Because you, you don't have it's, drugs to no. get you ready in sixteen weeks. I had weeks, my so. buddies in the gym, you know, and I'd do my little cardio, and then I'd roll <laughs> off and I'd lay on the floor when there's a window and the sun would come in, and I had a guy walk up and kick me one day, and he just nudged me and he goes, "It's so much easier on drugs," right. <laughs> you know. Right. I'm like, "Fuck you! I'm yeah, not going to do that. it. I'm not going to do it." Yeah, they don't get it. So. About halfway through, and again, eight months strict dieting, very strict, working 15, 16 shifts a, a month in the ER, family, you know, two younger kids, adding cardio in. Um, and my colleagues, the nurses, the people I worked with in the ER would come, are you training for another show? And I'm like, yeah, why? And I'm like, oh, you're just kind of snappy. Yeah. I was a bitch. Yeah. I was, I mean, absolutely. And got to a point, we lived in a two-story house then, towards the end. Our bedroom was upstairs, and I'd kind of sit at the, the ground floor, and I'd look up, and I'm like, I can't make it up these stairs right now. Stairs. I'm just going to sleep right here. Yeah. I was fried. Miserable. You know, and I'm like, no, I got to make it through the show. I was crabby. Right before the show, I got my blood drawn. Testosterone ranged 250 to 1100. It was 260. So it was normal. But I know how I felt. Mm -hmm. I absolutely knew. Did my rounds of shows, you know, decided, no, this, this, you know, I'm not I'm, doing this. I'm retiring. Mm -hmm. Tested myself, and that was over the summer in November. I was up around 750, 800, you know, sure, topper. And I felt normal. So there was my little, you know, end of Flip one this. experiment, mm -hmm. exactly. That, okay. And I remember one of the first guys I saw in the practice, uh, six foot four, you know, contractor, big dude. He sits down in front of me. And I'm like, so what brings you? He's like, I'm a bitch. I've become a bitch. I'm like, okay. And he's like, I'm snapping at everybody. You know, same deal with him, mm -hmm. you know, but this just happened normally mm -hmm. uh, uh, by virtue of age. So absolutely, I see it all the time. You know, that's, that's <laughs> absolutely. So it's a, it's a typical process where somebody has gone through all this stuff from, from, you know, kind of the, 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 the system, uh -huh. right? And what I wasn't, what I was learning and what I wasn't crediting was the stresses that I was going through, that I wasn't managing that, sure. and that the lifestyle, right, as well as some of it I thought was the right thing to do, mm -hmm. was, was hurting me, right? Yeah. And it was, it was absolutely contributing to the problem, and my symptoms were absolutely a manifestation of the mm -hmm. lifestyle and the things that I was doing more specifically, yeah. a lot of the things that I wasn't doing to take care of myself. Yeah. And That's the mentality is I'm going to plunge on more. I'm just going to keep going. Yeah, more gonna, is better. Right? Right. Just keep going, yeah. keep full throttle. Right. And let's do this. It right? will get better. And, and, and actually all it did was made it, made it yeah. worse. Uh -huh. So, and what I see, unfortunately is people hit this plateau and they stay there. And the, the mindset becomes, this is how it I is. I accept this. This is, is what it is. And what I find then, if they're exercising, that falls off. Then weight starts getting them. Then they're not getting off the couch. Well, why why eat well if I'm not doing anything? And it's just a downward spiral, mm -hmm. you know? And I think a lot of what I see is people don't have to suffer with that. They just don't know about right. how to fix it. So yes, yeah, so like they, you learned, they, they don't you know? know. They don't know that they don't have to feel that way. exactly. Right, and and it's uh, and it it's not taboo. Like yeah. if it's not taboo to give a sixteen year old girl birth control and give her artificial hormones, mm -hmm. then why is it why is it taboo oh, to be giving a, four, a forty year old male or female uh -huh. for that matter? Yeah testosterone yeah they have it right. too right they lose it as well we're gonna get into that yeah. so let's talk about that so why is it why is it okay to let a male's estrogen go high yeah i see that so much here no in, particularly in the silicon valley i mean you got a bunch of high achievers here and people that are they're just working to the bone right mm -hmm. they're they're they're, yep. they're not taking time off there's so much competition there's so much stress there's so they're always looking over their shoulder right and they come to us and it's what you just described it's when they're kind of at rock bottom yeah and or and, and the one thing that you didn't mention there, which I we see and gets disclosed to us all the time, you mentioned you know the big contractor coming in, going, hey, I've been a little bitch, man. I'm snapping at everybody. It's different. There's a depression that starts oh, to set in, yeah. right? And then there's so there's a and this is a chemical change, right? That's happening in the body. So what happens? They go to the family doctor. They get put on an antidepressant. This is the yeah. over and over. That's the protocol. Yeah, and I've had patients come in and go, I'm not depressed. I've, I've got a good life. I just don't feel right. So, so now you've added another chemical to the system mm -hmm. to offset a chemical imbalance somewhere else, and you've done nothing to address the problem. Exactly. It's a Band-Aid, mm -hmm. right? Um, well, 
an attempted Band-Aid, and the, mm-hmm. and the reality of it is is it's not making anything better. You're just covering up the, the symptom, yeah. which, again, Which is actually a misdiagnosis. Mm-hmm. You know, naively, that's the way this system works, right. but it's the wrong diagnosis, right? you know? So let's talk about that. So you get a patient that walks into mm-hmm. the, to the, to the office, yeah. right? And we can talk about the process a little bit, but we've kind of talked about maybe why they're coming to you, right? Yeah, they, sure. they, yeah. But, and for me, I thought like, I felt like I was, tr- I had tried everything at this point. Mm-hmm. Like, um, and maybe it's like for the females, maybe a little bit on the different, on the no, different end of things. It's more maybe can, overt. <laughs> maybe you can talk about that. Maybe. Yeah. You know, know. And I, you know, I liken it that is men, it's a, it's a fade. You know, maybe there's, you know, you went through some life situations where it was more upfront, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of things going on there. Um, women have bar- a barometer, their menstrual cycle, you know, so they know what's going on. It's, you know, they get erratic, they, they start missing periods, it goes away, they get night sweats, they can get hot flashes, the libido goes down, there's vaginal dryness. Their symptoms are far more overt than us. With with guys, it's mostly oh, I can get through it. It's, I'm going to ignore we're it. I'm going to power through until you know uh, um, somebody who knows them mentions something and say, hey, you know, or they see that picture on the wall of them ten years ago and God, that was me. You right. know what's going on and uh, and look like you did for help. Right. Right? I want to know what's going on. There's something different here. For women, again, they go through menopause and you know. They can't miss it. They're very in tune with their bodies, far more than we are. So um, a lot of it is symptom control. Now they're not sleeping at night because they're waking up soaking the sheets. You got to change them. Now they're cold. Now they're kicking off the covers. And, you know, then they're wiped out during the day. So symptoms get worse. Mm -hmm. Brain fog. You know, I can't think, you know. Then there can be relationships, things in there. You know, sex drive goes down and, um Again, that's that's the main thrust with women, you know, and most women who come in to me uh, or people who do what I do, it, it's for symptom control. And I could tell they're miserable, you know. I don't do it for that reason. I do superficially. I want to get, get them feeling better. But we know when a woman goes through menopause, her risk for dementia goes up by 50%. Risk for heart disease goes up. Osteoporosis as well. So those are three things right there. Hormone replacement, getting them back to normal levels, we know helps. That goes now, back to your big five from the beginning. Exactly. That's why I tie that in. Now, you know, full disclosure, um, you know, they say you shouldn't be on hormones more than 10 years after you go through menopause. I disagree with that because we only have studies going 10 years. Mm -hmm. You know, we're never gonna have good studies proving it one way or another because we're never gonna take a thousand women in menopause in one group and a thousand in the other and say, okay, this group, you're getting hormones, okay? You're gonna control your symptoms, so forth. And in the other group, cold turkey, you're not getting anything. Okay, let's wait 40 years till they're, you know, it's over and see who wins. It's never gonna happen. Right. So I don't understand the concept that 10 years is this arbitrary line where you don't need the stuff anymore. Now it's okay to get osteoporosis for your brain to go to develop heart disease. That's not okay with me. Somebody's writing the rules. Yeah. It's weird. You know, and it's just, again, that's how long the studies have been. They've gotta have a, a, a stop date. Um, but I, I don't have to agree with that. Yeah, I think some of the other things that we see, I think kind of relating from the fitness side of things mm-hmm. to maybe the, the healthcare side of things is, you know, we mentioned these things on both sides for males and females, and, and they're, some of them are similar, and then obviously sure, some sure. biologically are very different. Very. Um, and physiologically, obviously manifest themselves different. But the other thing that I see happening is, is you know, they kind of go through this period where they're, they're kind of accepting that this is the way it is. Exactly, yeah. And then it gets to a point where it's, not just hard anymore, it's really fucking hard uh-huh. to come back out of it and come the other way because yeah. they've gained they've gained weight and it doesn't seem to matter, you know, at this point, now they, they start getting desperate. Mm-hmm. You know, they start doing things like, well, I'm gonna exercise again. Mm-hmm. So they start picking modes of exercise and exercise programs where they're, they're now stressing themselves out even more, right? right? And then the next natural thing is, well, if I wanna lose weight, I need to eat less and exercise more. Right. So they start decreasing calories. Already that's been happening. So uh-huh. from a metabolic perspective, their body's starting to adapt to using less energy to get yeah. the same amount of work done. And then they, 
doesn't seem to matter how much exercise they do, mm-hmm. how much dieting they do. They can't seem to link, lose weight and ultimately gaining weight. Yeah. And then it turns in, again, going back to the relationship piece. Mm-hmm. Well, now my husband doesn't look at me the same way he right. does. We don't have sex anymore. Mm-hmm. Like, we don't even want to. And then, so we've lost this part of the connection, and there's all these other things going on right. that don't get talked about. Completely. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And it doesn't have to be that no, way. No, no. So. Yeah, and I brought back, you know, I brought up, you know, you don't have to suffer. And I really mean that, you know. And looking back his story women just bared with it you know and, and men to a certain extent as well just but it's just not out there that's what destiny. it is this is what's getting old is right. you know it's like okay you're done having you know with procreation you, you know as a female you're not going to have kids anymore go over to the corner and be wise right. and when we we want to ask you something we'll come get you that's and it was accepted you know and we just don't need to do that anymore we've got things to help so when you talk about helping somebody and somebody comes to you with these symptoms and they're 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 looking for help, mm-hmm. let's talk about some of the things that you do that would be different, right? May look very similar, yeah. but are in reality very different to what they might get from their MD or from, yeah. from some, some other practitioner. So what are some of the things that you, you do right off the bat that kind of, this is standard, this is yeah. what we do, so I can have a picture right. you know, or, or insight to what's going on. I look at a lot of hormones. Let's talk you about know, just testosterone, progesterone, estrogen, cortisol, thyroid, a complete panel, T3, T4, reverse T3, vitamin D. It is a vitamin. It's also a hormone. Um, hemoglobin A1C, which is, you know, it's disputed. That's where we look for blood sugar control over mm-hmm. a few months. You know, that spectrum from not diabetic to diabetic. Um, it's not a great test. It's what we have, you know. Um I've, I've heard, I've seen other tests that were supposed to be better. I've tried them. And I just don't think they're ready for prime time. Um, they've never borne out. So it's what we have. Um, you know, it's, you know, the basic stuff, metabolic panel, kidneys, liver, so forth. But um, throw out the big net, you know, because a lot goes on. Cortisol affects thyroid, affects testosterone, affects which estrogen. You know, it's, I always think it's, you know, you can compare it like a spider web. You know, you pull on one side and this thing over here moves. You got a whole thing, all, all this stuff linking it together. Um, so a comprehensive uh, hormone panel really from the start, you know, so I can get a big picture. So let's talk about a few of those hormones that you just mentioned. Yeah. A1C is kind of one I think that probably is front of mind for a lot of people sure. because especially it's the most it, common. It's the most common. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it is one of those things that's getting run very commonly yeah. all the time as we're trying to manage this massive killer diabetes mm-hmm. um, that we're that we're dealing with. I mean, I think now it's 70% yeah. of kids have got mm-hmm. you're pre-diabetic now or something. It's crazy. Yeah. So that's the one that kind of gives us, you mentioned, it gives us that insight to what's been happening with blood sugar control over the last kind of a window of maybe th- three, three months, months or so, right? Yeah, yeah. And so it's a really good indicator of where things are going, mm-hmm. right? Or where things could go. Yeah. So it's a it's a marker and we have sure. to be careful of it. And you mentioned some some ranges, 5.7 to 6.4 yeah. or something uh, like that. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so once you kind of tip into the 5.7 range, it's not a red alert, but it's flagged and you should yeah. be yeah. you should be aware. Yeah, right? you should be I, aware. It, it's the pre-diabetic, right. you know, which I think is a red flag. My, my, my understanding of that is if you test mm-hmm. at 5.6 on more than yeah. one, one occasion, mm-hmm. you're considered pre-diabetic. Mm-hmm. That's, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. So you're you're already in the hot in the hot zone, mm-hmm. right? So things to be aware of if you're listening and you've seen your tests and, and yeah. whatever. Does that necessarily means it, it mean it needs to be treated right now with with medication? Uh, yes and no. Depends on what the person wants to do. Um, and I've treated with medication. I've treated with supplements. I've always treat with lifestyle, and lifestyle often fixes that. Um, I'm not opposed. Metformin is usually my go-to first line mm-hmm. um, because it may have other benefits aside from helping there. Like metformin has been around for decades. Um, one, if you're not diabetic and you take it, it will not drop your blood sugar. It's okay. safe. And there's a study, at least one going on right now. Um, I can't remember his name. Nirmal, I think is his first name. Okay. But, um, on the anti-cancer, anti-dementia benefits okay. of metformin. Um, I think that may be out in a year or so, if I got my timeline there correct. Um, but it's it's also been kind of called an anti-aging drug. 
And I'm on the fence there because I don't think we know the end result there. Um, but if I'm, I'm that concerned about somebody and I talk to them about a medication and they're like, yeah, I want to get this fixed, you know, metformin's easy. Okay. You, know, you just start right off on that, very safe. Um, you can titrate up doses. You just got to watch for GI stuff. But again, it's been around for a long time. But otherwise, supplements, you know, you got to get the receptors working. So we're talking about insulin sensitivity. Yes, yes. So, and I think a better term, we hear insulin resistance, mm -hmm. insulin sensitivity, you know, the flip side of that. Um, term I heard that I really like, um, I can't remember his name, PhD at the University of Colorado, um, hyperinsulinemia. Okay. Too much insulin in the blood. Because when we talk about resistance, you know, we're talking about on cells, but it does other things in the blood. I mean, it's a very disruptive hormone in certain aspects. Yeah, if you don't have it, you won't live. Right. But um, I like the term hyper, hyperinsulinemia. It just connotates a bigger picture there, you know, that it's a bad thing. It, it, it's sort of indicating your body's inability to deal with blood sugar process. Correct. Yeah. Blood sugar. Yeah, right? and insulin getting into the cell. Right. That's where the resistance comes from. Right. Um, you know, and it just keeps going up and up and up. And, you know, that's that stage where it starts. It and creates. I think a, a, a good test is insulin. Um, and I would actually, most commonly, a fasting insulin is obtained. Uh -huh. I'd rather somebody eat a bagel. And let's see where your insulin goes with let's that. see what happens. Uh, yeah. Let's drink some more I mean, juice. Yeah, let's yeah. do it. And, you know, if you're up in the hundreds, okay. You're so, resistant. So, so, yeah, so the point is, is like, if I eat a bagel, mm -hmm. right, or I, I drink that orange juice, yeah. what I should see is a spike in my insulin. Exactly. So, if my normal level is somewhere between 90 and 100. So, for right. insulin, you want it under 6. Okay. 8. Okay, let's call it 8. So, okay. two, to, 2 to 8, somewhere in there. So, it's a low level right. for fasting. For fasting. Going up to 20, okay, cool. After you eat. Right. You know, okay, fine. Going up to 80, 100, that's high. All right. Yeah. So just give you a perspective. Yeah. So as, so what you're saying is, is a doctor, you're like, you yeah, know, I'd actually just eat normal. Let's see what, or mm -hmm. maybe eat a little. Eat some carbs. Eat something that you wouldn't, you would typically eat for breakfast, you yeah. know, and then go take that blood test. Have that English muffin. Yeah. And tell right. people things that I never tell them, which is go ahead and eat carbs. Right. Eat a lot of carbs. Right. <laughs> right. Because I'm the flip side. Right. You know, we right. get into that. Yeah. Let's um, well, we'd manage. We, we often eat way too many, way more than we need to. Completely. Right. right. Yeah. So then it takes us into, all right, so if we're managing, mm -hmm. we're looking at blood sugar, the next thing is we're looking at like a cholesterol and lipid panel, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And statins and yeah. things that are being prescribed out there because somebody's looking high on a cholesterol panel. Right. Can you maybe talk to, <laughs> you know, cholesterol panels, what we know, where these numbers came from, where these standards came from, and what we're doing in terms of prescription medication as it relates? Yeah. You asked me that a year ago, and I could. And now I I'm honestly don't know where we're at. It's gotten so confusing, you know, and I, I freely admit in what I do, you talk about cholesterol and the statin drugs. It's one of the most polarizing things. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got the camp over here that everybody should be in statins. It should be put in the drinking water. It's the best thing in the world. And cholesterol is going to kill you tomorrow. And you got the camp over here. Cholesterol is not harmful. Uh, statins will kill you tomorrow. And, you know, obviously the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. Just where is that? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have seen, um, you know, kind of where we are there. Now, a standard lipid panel. Total cholesterol, HDL, LDL, and triglycerides. Gotcha. To many lipidologists who specialize in that is pretty worthless, unless there's few exceptions, and it's usually a genetic, familial thing. Okay. And most of those people know it to begin with. Yeah, they're coming in with some pre, pre So their numbers are going to be sky high. They're going to be high. You know, total cholesterol, say, over 350 or so. But otherwise, I don't use it to treat on my screening panel. I use it to talk about food. Mm -hmm. Diet. What are you doing? Okay. So your numbers are off. They're high. You know, the good stuff is, is low. The bad stuff is high. So I end up getting a more detailed panel later on. You know, um, I think, you know, Quest does the cardio IQ. Yep. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, there's a couple things on there. Apolipoprotein B. Looking at AP. Yep. Which is, I think, you know, the way I understand it, that's the sum total of all the bad stuff. And I think in the future, that's what we're going to look at, you know, because you got particle size, you got particle number, and this is a little guy floating around, right? It, it really right. kind of almost adds up all the bad stuff, you know. And lipoprotein A is in there, LP little a, which is genetic by and large. Um, you can't fix it, can't change it. If you're low risk, you're congratulations, low. Right. you know. If you're high risk and everything else is normal, you're at risk for heart disease. Um, Period. In fact, I've seen that, you know. But just 
you know, going kind of oh, maybe sideways on this, uh, I've had patients with horrible cholesterol for years on the expanded panel. Like, God, I, nothing I'm doing is working. So right. I send them for a cardi- uh, coronary artery calcium scan. Looks at calcium inside right. the, the heart. Which basically. is the problem, which is the killer. That's where you look right. for plaque, really. Right. And uh, score zero. The cardiologist goes, you have no risk. This cool. is fine. Cholesterol's not doing anything to him. Right. I'm seeing a guy next week. He's a returning patient. Last time I saw him was a year and a half ago, 47-ish. Um, he got his blood work on a Monday. Next Monday, had a heart attack, an MI, two stents. The following Monday, I saw him in the office. His cholesterol was perfect, absolutely low risk. So what happened, Right. you know? And uh, of course they put him on a statin drug because that's protocol. Right. Like, Your cholesterol's low, how much lower are we gonna drive it right. there? Um, so again, I, he's, I saw him on my schedule for next week, so, or two weeks. So I'll get to catch up on him, you know, what happened, right. man, you know? Right. Um, so, you know, it's been explained to me um, by one of my cardiology mentors. There's over 70 risk factors for developing heart disease, seven zero, of which cholesterol plays a role in you know, four to seven, somewhere in there. So there's a lot of other shit going on. Right. You know, inflammation, oxidative stress. I mean, you know, uh, endothelial dysfunction, which is the inside of your blood vessels are screwed up, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, there's also the... Um, the autoimmune theory that, you know, cholesterol's just, it's protective. It's your body trying to protect itself from environmental contaminants, right. from, you know, microbes. And it just, there's so much going on, it gets carried away and it becomes a chronic detrimental thing, not an acute cure. Right. So, you know, again, going, I guess, back to your, your question, I don't know where we're at. It's just, there's so much more information coming out. And I really did kind of a deep dive on cardiology back in December, November, December, and just kind of got a kick on it. And I'm like, okay, where are we on this stuff? And I came away with, God, I don't know where we're there's at on so this stuff. so much information. Yeah. Take more fish oil. Right. That's really what it came down to. So that actually brings me to the next thing, because you were just mentioning um, inflammatory markers. Yeah. And, and what I was trying to kind of maybe come back to is comparing it all against one another to kind of see what are the things that line up when we mm-hmm. see certain things? So go back to inflammation. Yeah. And you mentioned the first time you'd heard inflammation is when you went to this conference. Oh, and, yeah. and, Other and, than muscular skeletal. In this Absolutely. sense. So what are we measuring? And what is the what is the measurement? What are we actually measuring if you're looking for inflammatory markers? Yeah, and you know, it gets deep interleukins and just some other stuff. And to be honest, I'm that's I right. don't know, I don't order those a lot. CRP, high sensitive CRP, CRP mm-hmm. is a big one for the cardiovascular system. And it tells you, you know, um, under three or under one, low risk, one to three, moderate, right. three to ten is high risk, but it can be fooled by other things. If you have an infection, it can be uh, falsely positive. Um, that's about the best we got, you know, that I know of. So, so if you're looking at if you're so if you're looking at a blood panel and you mm-hmm. see like, okay, so I got this person that's uh, her, her A1C is say, you know, over five point six, maybe five point seven. Mm-hmm. Right? Okay, it's not looking so hot. And cholesterol is mid range, maybe kind of bordering on the mm-hmm. high, but that CRP number, that infl- yeah. inflammatory number, is a bit high, like six seven. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's true. Uh-huh. Th- then we have we have some things we need to we yep. need to change. Mm-hmm. Do I need to throw medication at this person right now? No. No, tell me what are the things that I can walk out of the door or she can walk out of the door with right now from a lifestyle perspective uh, to impact those things without getting on a statin, yeah. right? Without getting on metformin, right? Without going, you know, down this long pharmaceutical road. road. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, can, yeah. what can she do? Number one, again, I'm a big advocate, cut carbs. You know, I, you just alluded to it. We just eat too much to begin with, you know? Um, you just, you know, there's a study out years ago. Um, start your day with protein, good healthy fats. Right. Um, you get better fat burning all day. You'll lose some weight. And truly, I haven't, I've done that for years. I don't know where I started. It just happened. I don't have carbs until dinner. Wow. Um, wow, that's interesting. You know, I'll train all, and I train fine that way. You know, and, okay, and come on from a bodybuilding perspective. That's, you got to have your oatmeal in the morning right. and this, and you got to right. eat every three hours. And I ended up having to stop in my late 40s because I was getting fat. Right. You know, I felt like shit. Interesting. And, like, and I realized, dude, you eat too fucking much. Right. Everybody, you know. So I just, I don't eat a lot anymore. So you train yourself to do less or do more with less. Yeah. Or do yeah. The same. And as we get older, we have to. Right. You know, a lot of it doesn't matter what we do, man. The metabolism. Metabolism shows slows down. I don't care what I throw at you. Hormonally, yeah, we could probably get get extreme, but metabolism slows down. Number in what I explain to people all the time, 
you get to a point where I think the body goes, stop feeding me. Right. All I do is digest all day. Mm-hmm. That's enough, you know. We mm-hmm. get into fasting and the benefits there and time restricted feeding. Um, you know, that's what we've done over time is fasting, you know, and it gives the body a break where it's like, oh, thank God, I don't have to digest food anymore. I can actually fix myself. Yeah, this is you an know? interesting thing right now, particularly because it's very popular, right? This is very, oh, very, yeah. oh, very yeah. popular to be talking about. It's almost like, like trendy, which is unfortunate. Right. And it's, again, people are taking in this information with zero context. Yeah. And one of, in the context of this conversation, we're talking about somebody that's maybe in their 40s mm-hmm. and suffering from some hormonal downregulation, right. right? Some upregulation of other things. Insulin, especially. Yeah. And those kind of things, in which case, you know, we're hearing out there, hey, you got to eat carbs, you got to eat carbs. Yeah, okay, eat some carbs, but right. how much should exactly. you be eating and, and what types should you mm-hmm. be eating? And yes, you, you, you need to be getting that stuff in there, but as we age, as our metabolism mm-hmm. changes, as our chemistry changes, as our demands, right? The, imposed, the self-imposed demands, mm-hmm. environmental demands, and things like that change. We have to make adjustments. Absolutely. Right? And there is no one size fits all. No. But we do know that what, what you're saying is, is like, hey, listen, let's cut back on this a little bit. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying eat less. I'm mm-hmm. just saying eat less of this. Yes. Yeah. And there's enough research out there now. I mean, it's, it's, there's, it's starting to dominate. Like, hey, we know protein surplus, mm-hmm. right? With caloric restriction, right? You're going to lose some weight, yep. right? You, you still need enough calories to get yeah. through the day. And I'm not, we're not saying no carbohydrate. Right. We're just saying, like, how much do you really need? Uh-huh. And we got to figure out that formula. And it you. may take some time to break the insulin resistance and bring that down some. Getting your body, yeah. your body's regenerating your bodies or returning on or sending it the signal that, hey, there's not so much in there now mm-hmm. that your body can't respond to yep. it, right? Which is what insulin resistance is. There's right. so much in there that your body, your body cannot. Yeah, good way to put c- it. Cannot switch it, switch on correctly. Uh-huh. You take it away, and it's amazing what the body will do, right? Uh-huh. In terms of in terms yeah. of adjusting. Yeah. So it's so not about it's not about drugs. No, no, right. and that's that's number one. You know, is is the carb cutting, uh, fish oil. I've already said it. Yeah, a that's a big one. Omega three fats. If you're not doing this now, you're simply just not paying attention. <laughs> yeah, and you know it was. Uh, uh, this is when I went and kind of did the deep dive in uh, December on cardiology and everything. And just a lot of the experts are now. So if you get an omega-3 index from Quest, let's say, uh, upper end, you know, their range is like five. Let's say you should be between three and five. Okay. Just throw out some numbers there. It's pretty close. They're saying that should be double. We should be shooting for 10. So, which will flag everything red on that test, like, you know, bad, but it's not, it's just good red is what I call it. Um, we should be double, doubling the omega-3 intake, uh, cardiovascular health and brain health. Put, put that into perspective for us just in terms of amateurs. So, mm-hmm. you know, I go to Costco, yeah. right? I look on the shelf and I've got my, my fish oil yeah. right, that's sitting on the, on the shelf there and I pull that off and it's uh-huh. like, it's typically going to be like a half a milligram to yeah, 750, a, yeah, 800, maybe, 800 somewhere near. Maybe. Yeah. If I want to get my number where and above and beyond uh-huh. where they're saying, because you're not going to generally hurt yourself, like there's nothing right. toxic about this, right? Yeah. So unless you're taking a shit supplement mm-hmm. that has other shit on which board, which I would say, yeah, which is an entirely different conversation. Shop somewhere else, we could spend all day long at Costco's, <laughs> not where you buy your fish oil, no, <laughs> or any of your supplements for those who's listening. But anyhow, the the, the bottom line there is, is where you know how much fish oil should I be taking? Like, what would be a what would be a prescription for you? Two grams twice a day. Two grams. You know, and I'll tell people, start with a couple gel caps. Because, again, different flavors, different amounts. You know, it could be 750, 850, whatever. The DHA, uh, EPA components can mm-hmm. be different and so forth. And it's just too much to kind of you know, get every single label and look and go, okay. It's start with a couple grams in the morning. You can do it two grams in the evening, great. Right. If you want to go up to three and three, fine. Add fish in if you want to eat that. You know, if you can, a lot of people just don't. Um, it's a good start. You know, so you're talking you said, about four to six grams a day. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's really the only limiting thing would be GI. You go too much too fast, right. you get some loose stool. Right. Okay, stop. Slow, Slow it down. On it. It's like and, eating too much sushi one night. Yeah. And then just right. work your way back up slowly <laughs> right. so it doesn't happen. Um, there's not much of a downside. You know, they're great anti inflammatories. It was explained to me there's like 35,000 studies on fish oil and Alone. how good it is. And, right. But you'll only see the one published where 
it, it, you know, it causes heart attacks. It's the worst thing in the world for you, you know? And I've looked at those studies and they usually use a crap supplement or it's a bad study, you know? But it, and it goes against a, a body of evidence um, proven abundance. benefit, yeah. you know? Abundance of evidence. Yeah. yeah. You know, same thing, you know, vitamin D, same deal. You know, people will read something. It doesn't prevent falls in elders. Well, okay, that's not why we take that's, it. <laughs> so why do we take vitamin D? Yeah, why do, why do we take vitamin D? You uh, mentioned it. You mentioned vitamin D being a vitamin, but also, it's also a hormone. Oh, so it's, right. it's involved in like over 300 reactions in the body. Mm -hmm. So that's what the hormone part of it is. Um, one, it's the number one vitamin deficiency in the country because we're all inside all the time. The only real the place we get it from is the sun. We're scared of skin cancer. So we put sunblock on, there goes your vitamin D. Right. You know, and I, I just had this conversation with a guy today uh, who's moving to Florida, like all my patients. <laughs> um, his, low, his vitamin D was low. He's like, well, I'm going to Florida, but I'm worried about skin cancer. Go out in the sun for 10 to 15 minutes, then put on your sunblock. Okay, you're not gonna get burned in 10 to 15 minutes. It's not gonna happen. So then put the sunblock on, but at least you get that, the, the absorb it. But it's the number one vitamin deficiency in the country because most of us are inside most of the time. Um, <clears throat> we don't get enough, but low levels are associated with more dementia, cancer, heart disease, diabetes. There's always the bone health thing in there as well. Now it's COVID. The, the <laughs> Number one, take it for that. You know, just, it, it's just so clear the benefits. You know, and I've got it, you know, I'm a stickler on vitamin D with my patients and I've probably had now under 40 patients have COVID uh, in my practice and I have several hundred patients. Um, I can only recall one guy getting real sick. Didn't go to the hospital. Um, he just felt like hell for Terrible 11 days. Symptoms, yeah, yeah. I, I can't remember if he's good about his D or not. You know, mm -hmm. cause there's some people they just don't take it. But I mean, 60 year olds, 70 year olds that are like, yeah, I thought I had a cold. I ended up testing positive. It wasn't a big deal. What's the clinical dosage that people should be thinking about taking in order to to, to be to replenish? Yeah, their 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 vitamin D. One, get tested if you can. I you know I hear that thrown out. Take this, take this. Yep. You know, and um, you can test for it. It's easy. You know, I put people basically on five thousand a day. Yeah, and that's what you want to get them. units. That's what you yeah. want to get them to. Yeah, right. and you want vitamin K in it because between vitamin K, vitamin D, that's how you tell calcium where to go. Well, right, vitamin K tells it what to do. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's like the messenger. Not yeah. enough cows or not enough vitamin K. Calcium goes to the arteries. Okay, that's bad. That's bad. We that's just discussed that. Bad, right? You know, you got enough. Um, goes to the bones. That's where we want it. Right. You know? And, you know, when I realized that several years ago, it's like just, you you know, take calcium. You take calcium for strong bones. Just because you take it for strong bones doesn't, doesn't mean it's, it's going go to your there. bones. You know, it's going to like go any, where it's told to do. It's like anything else. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. And just because you're taking a vitamin or you're eating a particular food or drinking a particular micronutrient or whatever doesn't mean your body can utilize it. It does. Whatever. And we haven't even gotten into gut health and your body oh, and, yeah. your, and leaky gut and yeah. your body's ability to even use and it. And that's what, okay. What might be going on there. <laughs> yeah. And that's a whole, again, a whole oh. other conversation yeah um, rabbit hole so getting you know you could be taking vitamin d and not even getting the vitamin d if mm -hmm. you've got you got, know, gut issues yeah a permeable, you don't absorb permeable gut mm -hmm. yeah gut lining sure um, yeah i've actually had to put a few people on injectable because they just would not absorb it can't it did absorb not matter liquid um i use some high quality supplements those we tried every different way i remember one guy he had a partial bowel resection for uh crohn's disease um and injection and both of them were like, wow, I felt like I was a new person. They just felt completely different uh, once they got up normal. So um, it's, it's, I don't know, fascinating uh, chemical, you know, in what it does. Interesting. I, you know, I learned, we've learned so much about it and this is hopefully the information, this is stuff we've known for a long time. Right. Yeah. And like when you say, I say we, I've, you know, done my fair bit of research sure. and learned yeah. a ton from you over the yeah. last few years. And, and you just take that and you, you run with it and you try to, you know, gain that knowledge. And people are just hearing about vitamin D it's, for the first time now. Yeah. You know, how long does it take for, for people to understand that, you know, it's not, it's, it's not good enough to take 200 
no, no. units. Like they say, it, the recommended daily allowance. And right. That's nothing. That's not even close no. to it. Right. No. And again, we mentioned the whole vitamin K component and, mm-hmm. and, and and whatnot, which is often missed. And the quality, right? No. Where is it being sourced? How is it being produced? And I've tested a lot of people on Costco supplements, and their level starts here, and it's still there. Right. It it does, I'm like, you know, where are you getting this from? It's right. like, okay, it's not working. Yeah. <laughs> So you, throw you it do, away, start over. In, in a lot of cases, you do get what you pay for. Yep. Right? Yeah, yeah for sure. Completely. Yeah. All right, well, um, I, kind of moving forward, just yeah. in terms of, like, the process, you know, if somebody's coming <clears throat> to, and I'll, actually, this is a good point to, or a good point to bring up. What we've heard you say sort of inadvertently or, or sort of without calling attention to it is that you're not, you're not taking the place of a person's primary care physician. Not at all. Not at all. That's not your job. No. Not my How gig. does the interplay work? Um, I require people to have a primary care physician, you know, because mm-hmm. they still need the routine stuff, you know, blood pressure checks, whatever, routine physicals and all that. Um, I just don't do those anymore. That was my choice. You mm-hmm. know, I don't have an office set up for that. I'm more consulting. You know, I get my own tests. I prescribe. I recommend and so forth. I counsel. But, you know, I don't know the the recommended screening periods for anything, right. you know, that's a family practice physicians, mm-hmm. you know, uh, thing, um, you know, when do you get a prostate exam? When do you get, you know, breast right. exams, mammograms? I kind of know, but I just don't. That's not something you need to concern yourself with. No, right? no, right. no, that's just not, it's, you know, I had to make a choice when I transitioned into this practice. I think the benefit was what do I want this to look like? Mm-hmm. What do I want to do? You know, um, I wanted to do things that I thought were valuable that really meant something. And not that those things don't, it's just somebody else does those better. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll stick to what I'm good at right. and try and get better and be able to add whatever, you know. Gotta be honest, Bob, you don't hear that from a lot of doctors. Yeah. There's a lot of ego in that business. I don't know, I don't associate with many yeah. anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so, yeah. so if, I've, if I'm seeing a primary care physician yeah. and I wanna see, and I wanna get in to see a guy like Dr. Bob, mm-hmm. what should I expect the process to be like? What do I have to do? As a patient? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when I started this, um, little history, I started it, I'd say out of, you know, in the back of my pickup truck. Mm-hmm. I did house calls. Um, I would talk to somebody, I'd order labs, I'd wow. show up at their house, I'm like, hey, okay, no, you don't wanna go to the house, let's go to Starbucks, you know, we'll get coffee, whatever. Interesting. I didn't have an office, because I was still in the ER. Um, like, I don't, wanna, I don't even know if this is gonna work. I don't <laughs> know where this is going, <laughs> right. you know? When, you know, just to flash back, my first conference, maybe 200 of us. Those conferences these days, there's thousands thousands of physicians in, in practice from all over the world now. It takes up the the bottom of the Venetian, um, the whole conference in center. In Vegas, yeah. Yeah, it's, and before it was like two little rooms. That was the whole deal. So this thing's growing. It, yeah, it's, I mean, I'm just, now when I go to these things, I'm overwhelmed. And I just look at all the people, like, holy shit, you know, I guess it did work. That's know? great. That's and you know, you kind of, again, if it didn't work, I think it would have gone away. Um, but, you know, when I started, I was like, I don't want to get an office. I don't know anything about that. Um, you know, I don't have a lease, rent, whatever. I don't know what I'm going to do There's with this. There's a business here. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so I, for probably at least the first year, it was house calls or meet wherever. And then uh, the gym I trained at in Reading, I call it the uh, Harry Potter room because it was a broom closet under the stairs. <laughs> and it was, that's what they used it for. And <clears throat> I traded them. They wanted supplements, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that a physician had to order. Uh-huh. So I let them use my account and they gave me the room. And uh, it fit a little tiny table and a small desk. And I would see people under the stairs. You know, I called it the Harry Potter room because that's kind of what it was. Wow. So I went rent free there for probably a year or two. And then we kind of got to that point. It's like, you know, we're getting too big, too much, mm-hmm. you know, what are we going to do? Got our first office, uh, actually a partner of mine. Um, he was a surgeon in Reading who did the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he, um, when we realized we were doing the same thing, he bought a practice called Body Logic, which is what I'm with now. Okay. And it's, it's a big group. I don't know. I don't know how many offices there are 40 in the country. There's 60, 70 doctors okay. or so. And what that is, 
the headquarters is in Florida and they function as our back office. They do the marketing, they sign patients up, they order the initial labs, they put everything in the EMR, they schedule, they move things. So I don't have to have the office here and the personnel to do all that. Uh, I have one office staff, mm-hmm. you know, my, Laura runs the business, so I've definitely got that covered. But, um, and that's, you know, Harry's my guy at, in in the office. He just takes care of everything out here. Right. But patient, uh, patient scheduling. Yeah, and talking to him, checking him out and all right. that. And he manipulates the schedule. I mean, he does quite a bit, but the bulk of it is done at our corporate headquarters. They do that for all the offices. Right. And that so, can be done, so it can be done remote. Absolutely. Regardless of where you yeah. are, you're gonna be dealing with that. Yeah, office. and that was the benefit of having that in place a year ago when shit went sideways yeah. with everything. Yeah. And a lot of the practices back east, for the most part, did pellet therapy, which is a procedure you need to be one-on-one with the patient. Well, those offices closed. Because they couldn't, because, they couldn't, they because couldn't of, you know, the pandemic, they right. were like, they, they had to make the choice. Do we stay open or close? So they, had to, so they lost a big portion of their business. Body Logic already had in place uh, virtual stuff. We use Microsoft Teams. So that was all done so that they converted all those people to, okay, we'll just do it all, you know, online. And uh, it was an easy transition. But yeah, it, it's taken care of a lot like that. So somebody just goes to the website, Body Logic MD is what it is, and hits my name and then signs up. Right. You know? And somebody talks to them and says, this is what it is. This is what this is about. This is what you do. Um, I go over the cost and everything and they plug it into my calendar and set you up for an appointment. And so when they set you up though, and you come in, you've already actually been set up with all the the blood yep. screens and everything else. So yep. We've done this long enough. We know what we you want. figured it out. Yeah. yeah. You know, versus when I started, I'd meet with you. Right. Okay. And so I realized a, I'm ordering the same stuff over and over. Right. It really doesn't change. And that's your time, mm-hmm. right? And that's it's money. Theirs. And it's and it's their yeah. money yeah. and, and so, their time as well. So, so now you just streamline cut it. that. Exactly. Let's just streamline it. So, exactly. hey, before you come see me, we're just going to order up mm-hmm. all this stuff. And then when you get here, we'll have the discussion. So we have something to talk about. And we'll, we'll talk about it and we'll, we'll yep. take steps from there. Yeah. So it's a little bit, it's much different. Right, uh-huh. and then go into your family practitioner for the for the Let's first time. Let's order or, these labs. Yeah. I'll see you back in three weeks. Right. And it's like, no, I want something now. There's downtime yeah. and, mm-hmm. and all these other things. So you got to get through a little bit of a process, and you yeah. get there. Yeah, I think one of the things to add here that people should expect, and this was my the thing that impressed me the most about my first visit was you spent. In, it's probably my fault, but you spent more than an hour with me yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. the first time. It wasn't like. My previous experience yeah. going in to see these other doctors where I saw the doctor mm-hmm. maybe five minutes only to be told you're normal yeah. or, you know, oh, you don't have any allergies. I spent an hour in this office and I've seen you all of three right. minutes here and you're fine. And and then, OK, now what? Yeah. I, I don't really have an answer for you. Yeah. I sat down and you walked me through. I learned more about my internal and personal health in an hour than I had spent collectively with any amount of doctors in my entire life. Yeah. The benefit is I can do what I want with this practice and I I can, nobody's dictating it. I can say it's an hour. I can say it's an hour and a half. You know, I look at my schedule. If we get going and I have an opening afterwards, I don't care. I don't need the break. We'll keep talking about stuff. Um, You know, it's the flip side of emergency medicine. When I did ER, you came in, you know, patient came in, you get one complaint. Right. Okay. That's all I got time for. Mm -hmm. And I was really good at that, at dealing with the complaint and moving on. I saw a lot of patients in our group, you know, and, and that's, that, that's that scenario. That's what it, it has to be for the most part. You know, you get somebody going, oh, and while I'm here, can you check? No, no, that's not your emergency. That's what we got to deal with now. Cause I got people in the waiting room. We got to move. This practice is the opposite. No, I want to know more. You know, I, I don't want to know that one thing. I we got to talk about exercise, about nutrition, about your life. You know, I a lot of times I'm guilty of just I guess BSing in the beginning with patients. It's not really that. I want to get a feel for what's going on. Yeah, your family, How are personal you, relationship. How's the family doing? Yeah. You know, oh, you were remodeling the house last time. We talk. how's that going? Because that's stress right there. You know, and I can, you can tell if you, you speak to enough people, you get an idea. It's okay. Where are we going with this? So I like, like to kind of relate that as like now you're becoming their partner in health mm-hmm. versus yeah. this Absolutely. guy who throws prescriptions at you. Or, yep. it, it is, by the way, again, we already, we've already explained. Those doctors are having a tough time, man. They're up against a... a has its place in time. It is tough to, mm-hmm. to operate. I mean, 
it, it used to be, you know, you maybe had a roster with 500 patients on it and you made X amount of dollars and you knew what you're going to make on it. And now with the way insurance is getting, yeah. you know, and, and everything else, they have to have 1,500 patients mm -hmm. on their roster. They're going to see double the people in half the amount of time. Yeah, five minutes. Man. Yeah, and it's, 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 it's a tough place to be. Yep. Yeah, I feel for them, you know, and, and we had to make a decision when I left the ER, what, you know, what's this going to look like? Let's do it our way, right. you know, because I don't take insurance. Mm -hmm. um, and I, that was a conscious, absolute conscious decision. Yep. You know, I kind of snuck in there, the insurance scam earlier. And you know, when I worked in the ER, we made 29 cents on the dollar. <laughs> that was our reimbursement, you know, and I'm, I kept thinking, where else in the world are you going to go? You go to the grocery store. Here's a hundred dollars in groceries. I got $29. That's all you're getting, but I'm going to take all my food. You know, and it was just accepted the way it is. But, and you know, there's some artificial bloating of prices because to say the, the least. dealers know that. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna, you know, we're gonna charge this much because hopefully we'll get that much. And to, I just, to me, I just don't like bullshit. Right. I just don't like that. So it's like, no, this is the cost. That's it. Right. You know, you know what you're getting. That's it. Right. Yeah. It's, you know, not, it's yeah. not a surprise. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, and, and to say, you know, that you, your office doesn't take insurance doesn't mean like if you have these blood tests oh, no, taken like, or whatever else. Yeah. 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 Those will get covered sure. most of the time. And mm -hmm. there's ways to, to work through that. Mm -hmm. I've seen this kind of a new way of practicing medicine. Yeah. Um, maybe not new for you, but it's been new. That That's kind of been where a lot of yep. a lot of physicians have been mm -hmm. going in the last several years. Oh, yeah. The chiropractor. Yeah, or, we didn't innovate it. <laughs> right. So, right. We just took it. <laughs> yeah. It's just out of necessity. Yep. Right. To mm -hmm. get the things done, you need to get done for your right. patients. And so right. Forth. And the a big trade off is exactly what you said. The time I now I can afford to take the time to talk to people and, and take really a full help. hour for my initial consult. Right. You know, my follow ups are half an hour. Um, sometimes we get chatty and we go longer. Yeah. It's OK. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I just kind of, I don't want to spend too much time here, but on yeah. the COVID thing, like how yeah. has that changed how, how you practice? Because we know how it's changed and it's thrust doctors and patients yeah. into a very uncomfortable mm -hmm. situation now yeah. where you're doing this telehealth medicine, like we're not actually going to the office if we don't have to, right. which means we're not being hands-on right. at all. And we're prescribing medications, we're diagnosing, mm -hmm. you know, we're taking people down this, again, this di di dictated path, yeah. you know, or this protocol. Um, has, has it changed for, for you and what you're doing and your colleagues? None, yeah? not for me, right. okay. Uh, it was harder hit on our East Coast practices, I think. Um, you know, honestly, Scott, when it all started a year ago, I was I read the research. I spent two hours every morning reading the research. What happened yesterday? What's come out? What's new? Do I need to close my offices? Hmm. Is this a safety hazard? Is it, you know, I had, you know, I had to make that call. And after a month or so, I couldn't convince myself to do it. So I stayed open, you know, and now my office there's usually never more than three people in there right. at a time so it's low anyways. Right. And now you've got four rooms, you know, a waiting room and a, a, you know, a reception area. So I don't pack people in. I don't see sick people. Right. So it's not high volume by any stretch right. of the imagination. Right. They come to you because they don't want to be sick and they're exactly. not getting sick. And I'm very punctual. I try to be. So people usually people do not wait. You know, if I'm five minutes, if you, you have a 10 o'clock appointment and it's 10 oh five, I'm starting to get anxious that I got to get to you because right. I got to finish up with this person, right. you know? So I don't think I've ever gone 15 minutes over. Um, it's your time. I don't want you sitting there, you know, cause I've been to the doctor's office and it's like, Oh God, my appointment was two hours ago. So and obnoxious. Now I go into another room and I wait another 45 minutes and I know I hear that guy walking around in the hallway out there <laughs> and he just grabbed my chart off the wall. Um, but no, it's, I'm pretty punctual that way, but I really looked at it. And when I, you know, honestly, when I realized a year ago, it wasn't the zombie apocalypse, I'm like, no, I'm staying open, you know, and we had no outbreaks, you know, it just didn't happen. So for, for our practices, not a big deal. I, we're starting to see some of it right now, but the, the transition, we did go more remote. You know, we talked about this earlier. Um, I still do some procedures that hasn't really tailed off, but for a lot of people, it was more, look, I'll call you. We'll do the consult over the phone because you're worried about coming in. Right. Fine. That's cool. You know, I also have patients from all over the place. I mean, I had two patients drive from Fresno today. 
mm. you know, which they do it every three months. And uh, I just can't imagine that drive sucks, but it does suck. You know, it's for a lot of those people like, look, you know, um, we'll just do it on the phone. I'll okay. just call you, we'll have the consult there. And a lot of people felt much more comfortable. No problem, you know, cause we can handle that now. So it's become more virtual in yeah. a sense. Um, other than that, not a whole lot, uh -huh. you know. So, yeah. So on that note, so now we're we're, we're going down that that path. Let's talk vaccines. Oh yeah. I'm not the vaccine expert. You know, you know? Well, I'm going to put you on the spot. I don't know if anybody is. No, absolutely not. They're they're, and, they're until not. yesterday. I was saying Johnson and Johnson all the way. Right. Until <laughs> yesterday. Yeah. Uh, that was pretty scary. And, yeah. You know, I, there's a lot of people out there that are going well. You know, this was kind of bound to happen. There are yeah. a lot of things. Other people would say, well, huh? I fucking told you so. Yeah. Like. She can do that with anything. You can. You know? So let's be candid and honest. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. where do you stand on the thing? Um, if you are in a high risk position, you should do it. Okay. If I was in the ER, I'd already have it. If I was working in the ER. If you're, you know, frontline EMS, you're dealing with people on a, a volume basis, you're exposed, you're in a nursing home working there. Absolutely. You don't want to, you know, be the, the spark that's, that starts anything. Um, for high risk people, sure. You know, if you're 67, type two diabetic, you know, history of heart disease. Um, Seems like the smart thing to sure, do. Sure, you know, I still think the benefit far outweighs the risk. Um, in that case. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, and for many people, you know, if you're scared, if you're still worried, you know, if you're not going out of your house because of all that, get it, get out of the house. You know, if it, if it opens up your life now, do it. Okay. You know, personally, I'm not like that. You know, I haven't really stopped doing the normal things I do. Um, I, I had, I told it almost every, I had COVID in December. Um, my daughter brought it home from jujitsu. We knew that's where we were going to get it from because you can't it. socially distance in that sport. No, not you know that. Nope. No, and we continued to train. Our gym stayed open. We continued to train. Oh, no, that's where it's going to come from. And uh, she came home one night and I'm like, oh, okay. And the next day she was sick. I'm like, oh, honey, we got to get you tested. And she was positive. And we're like, okay, we'll spend Christmas together. And, right. um, you know, it, for us, it wasn't a big deal. We're, we're a healthy family. So. We've been through it once. If it happens again, well, you know, you know, I guess you can argue the whole for the community thing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't deal with large groups of people. Again, I, you know, my practice one on one all the time. I don't pack the waiting room, so I'm not in that environment. Mm -hmm. um, but at, to a certain point, I still believe in personal choice and freedom. And it should be up to us um, as reasonable human beings to make that choice. You know, I have said several times, if it gets to a point that in order to get on an airplane, I need a vaccine card, I'm gonna have to think hard about it. Mm -hmm. Cause I've done plenty of traveling right. um, and I'm not gonna stop that. So, right. um, you know, if it gets there, which I hope it doesn't. Yeah, do you think it does? I don't know, I don't know. If there's enough weird shit going on the last year, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, the world's kind of gone you know, sideways, it seems like. So, um, I don't know, I don't think, it could happen, but it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Well, it is. There so, has been some weird shit, and there yeah. has been some limitations. And one of those limitations, we we talked a little bit about, um, you know, like the world of CrossFit and the games yeah. and all mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Getting on airplanes and traveling, and you know, you were doing some 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 traveling around for vacations and also oh, to yeah. compete and, and mm -hmm. visit and see see different things. And yeah, sure. Well, so let's get into that. I mean, we this, we're talking a little bit about this before we got started today, but um, yeah. you know, so the question is is What's the competitive spirit these days and where are you with everything? What's going on? Um, still training. Yeah. Uh, never stopped. You know, unfortunately, my CrossFit gym closed in the summer permanently. Yeah. Just and, as, a, um, as a victim of the, you know, the and, and the owner is a friend of mine and I was actually glad for him um, because he started early on in CrossFit, uh, very early. And it was cool for him then, but as I think he got older, it just, he didn't have the acumen behind it and it became a burden, you know? Um, he wanted to do something else. And he was Air Force Reserves, doing a lot of time going from Reading to Sacramento, training in the Air Force and disaster management, which he fell in love with. And he had to close during the first shutdown and then, uh, all the other gyms in Reading were opening up 
they're basically saying, screw this, we can't afford it, we're opening up, right. you know? And they did. And he said, no, if I, if, if, if I open up, I could lose a stripe in the Air Force. So I was like, okay, cool, you know, oh, wow. should get you demoted or anything. Um, and then he had a, then he could open, then he closed again, and he finally just called it quits. And a lot of us looked into buying it, um, but he just parted everything out. It's the best move in the world for him because right. uh, he actually just got hired uh, in a county north of us as director of disaster management. Oh, good for him. I mean, fantastic. Right. You know, yeah, he's come a up. great guy at, at work. Mm -hmm. But for us selfish people, our gym was gone <laughs> and I had a key to the place. So, right. um, you know, it's been training at home from the garage and, you know, which I'm fine with. But all my training buddies and we got a great master's group, you know, every, all of us are over 45, right. most over 50, we have a fantastic group of guys. Um, that got taken away. That was our Sunday mornings, our master's morning, you know, 9 a.m. we'd be at the gym. Some guys golf. We train, Some guys go. you know, and two of these guys have been to the CrossFit games as master's athletes, fantastic uh, people and athletes. So that got taken away and just about five weeks ago, one of us, uh, a buddy of mine, he got the key to his gym. So uh, we're back together. Oh, awesome. So in that time, it's like really, you know, spin away. For me, it's always, what am I training for? And yeah, I could use that, that excuse for life. And sometimes it's like, what does that mean? You know, be hard to kill. Well, yeah, define that one, right? right? Um, so practical. Yeah, exactly. And uh, found something called the tactical games, which is basically CrossFit meets guns. And I thought, wow, well, that's fucking America. Cool. Yeah. And really looked into it. And it's pretty new. I think it's just a few years old. It's brand new. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it really is. It's functional fitness. Um, you're geared up, you've got a plate carrier, you got your rifle, your pistol, go climb a rope, carry this sandbag, you know, 50 feet and try and shoot that target while your heart rate's your heart jacked rate's up, and yeah. you can't breathe right. and then do it again. Um, so it's just a mix of events. They're all over the place. There's one in Utah, May 1st and 2nd that I signed up for. So. Uh, I'll see what it's like. What's the know? training for that like for you right now? Like, what do you do? Just, I mean, how do you, I mean, First off, it's probably expensive. I mean, because yeah, for God's fortunately, sake, it's, yeah, it's, it's nuts. You know, I find a new love, and it's always expensive. it's always expensive. Like, yeah. Come on, well, that, that one got ridiculously expensive real fast. But yeah, I mean, tell us about the training a little bit. Like, what are you what are you doing? I mean, I heard you say carry sandbags and things yep. like that. How yeah. different is it than a lot of odd objects? Um, I still do CrossFit stuff, you right. know. Um, still a lot of you know met cons, lifting, mm -hmm. do barbell work, row bike, whatever, you know, uh, tons of pull-ups and all that. It's typical, typical CrossFit, you yeah. know, everything, gym stuff. But add in, put a plate carrier on, you know, and, and the plate carriers for guys are 15 pounds. Unfortunately, I have a 20 pounder. Um, that's just what I use. So, yeah. you know, go climb a rope with that thing now. Or yeah. Sunday when we were together, I forget what workout we did. Uh, I wore the plate carrier for the whole thing. You know, he's got to get used to carrying that thing. You got to right. get used to the weight. You got to get used to pulling a sandbag onto your shoulder with a plate carrier and mags in the front, you know, which right. add to bulk. So a um, lot more running than I ever wanted to do. So that's the downside. Uh, seems to be a lot of running and running and I just don't get along well, <laughs> but it is what it is. So um, it's, you know, we're out where I live in uh, just outside of Reading, we're on five acres and everybody is, and there's kind of a trail that we have that's a mile. Mm -hmm. And uh, up hills, up down hills, across dirt, and I'll put the plate carrier on and I'll, you know, do my bob shuffle all the way around. Just go suffer. And, yeah, and just go, okay, you know, that's what you gotta do. So, um, you know, throw a 60 pound rock on my back and do the same thing, you know, <laughs> and it, that's really what it is. It's just kind of be ready for whatever. Wow. Which is kind of what CrossFit is, you know, right. it's like, okay, what do you want me to do? Right. You know, fortunately in this, I think there's more moving heavy shit, which I'm pretty good at. Yeah. So that's uh, the fun stuff. Yeah. I'm looking for, oh, and then go shoot. Something. And then you get to shoot stuff. Go, get, go shoot something, yeah. you know, these, this target, you know, 25 feet uh, or yards, you know, pistol, five shots. And then you go to the hundred yards, use your rifle, right? five shots, you know, every they're all timed. Every time you miss, they add 10 seconds onto your score. Oh, it's penalties. Oh yeah. yeah. So you got to hit, you know? So you got guys who just destroy the course, but come in shoot. last. They can't shoot. <laughs> yeah. Cause they're, they can either can't shoot or they're so, they're so jacked up when they get to the shooting, they just can't aim. 
Yeah, yeah. I love that mixed discipline stuff. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. really, it really separates folks. I, I, I spent a lot of time in multi-sport and triathlon, uh-huh. and the reality of that is, is anybody can do that. Anybody yeah. can get on a bike and run yeah. and swim. Yeah. And, and But I, there were some things that I did that I, I recognized that pretty early on. And uh-huh. I was like, well, at my, you know, at I was... 200 pounds at my lightest. Uh-huh. I mean, it, 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 I was a sophomore in high school and 200 pounds, yeah. you know, it, you know, a grown man at 200 pounds, a previous bodybuilder and whatever else I had to right. take all this weight off. There was no fucking way I was going to be able to go out there and be competitive on the flat uh-huh. road with a six foot two gazelle who'd spent right. his whole life, <laughs> you know, in the pool and running, it's just running a cardio lots. machine. Yeah. It's just getting crushed. So yeah. I tried some different things and yeah. really found where, there was some more skill involved in the sport. Right. Adventure racing was part of that. Yeah. There was a cerebral piece of Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Right. And then the other thing was um, the off road, like Xterra type off road yeah. triathlon, yeah. which there was a mountain bike skill that was involved sure. there in strategy. And I think the association there is let me find something that's hard yeah. that I'm not good at because right. I didn't grow up shooting at all. I mean, I picked up handguns about five years ago, four years ago. My rifle was like three months old. It, and uh, Wow, you're jumping right in. Yeah, and it, it's like, okay, it's hard, but that's what CrossFit was. I'd never done that stuff. It's like, okay, it's hard. I'm going to do it. I'm going to try it, you know, and I'm going to try and get good at it. And it's just obstacles to overcome along the way. Otherwise, what else are you going to do? Huh. You know, yeah. Listen, at home. I own a, I own a gym. Working out, <laughs> doing the same things all the time. Yeah. It's boring. Yeah, exactly. Let's, let's make it spicy. Going back to what am I training for? Right. You know, okay, this. Now I got something. You Sounds know, like it's it. it's there, and you know, uh, work towards it. Sounds like a shit yeah. ton of fun. Yeah, hopefully. Well, I might have to try that. Yeah. I'm just saying, maybe, yeah. maybe it inspired me. Yeah, we will do that. Um, Definitely. Listen, Bob. It, it, Thank you so much for your time today. I mean, always a wealth of knowledge. I mean, we just scratched the surface on so many things. I'm hoping the listeners took from that going, oh my God, that guy just went through more stuff. So much shit, (laughs) way beyond anything my doctor goes through. And I'm, Mm -hmm. man, I'm feeling maybe some of those symptoms or I'm, I'm, this, yeah, you're right. I haven't felt right for a long time. There might be something wrong. And I want to look a little deeper into this. I'm not saying my doctor's a bad guy, but maybe I need to, maybe I could, I could, I could source somebody else to help me understand a little bit more about myself because I really want to take responsibility for the way I'm feeling and, and, and yeah. the path to feeling better. And I tell people it's a different perspective and right. a different training. Right. It's just a different way of looking. And not that your doctor's doing wrong or anything. Right. It's just they don't see this side. Right. Yeah. It, yeah they're, it's not their scope and it's right. just not where they're at. So if people want to find you, if people want to talk to you, if people want to, to schedule an appointment with you or, or reach out to you, how do they do that, man? Uh, BodyLogicMD.com is the main website that's the practice and then dr bob porzio d-r-b-o-b-p-o-r-z-i-o that's my personal website uh that is a a continual work in progress (laughs) that will get uh uh, better and better just hit the contact page there yeah there i put more uh that's more of me i think um kind of how i approach patients recommendations to a certain point you know clarifying research that may not be straightforward or headlines that aren't real that is okay let's break this down this is what this is and that's my goal with that is information so how do you present that like just like in a blog format videos blog yeah (laughs) the video thing and just yeah not there yet so (laughs) it's enough to write it you like reading (laughs) i mean you said you got that that uh that background in english and creative writing so yeah uh So. so go there to learn about dr bob yeah there you go Thanks, All right. Yeah, like like I said, thanks again for uh, it's my for pleasure, man. Say hi to Laura for me. I will. All right, appreciate you guys. We'll talk sooner than later. All right, I hope so. Thanks, thanks, Scott. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Iron Sights. If you enjoyed our conversation, you can support our mission by hitting the subscribe button, leaving a review, and sharing the podcast with a friend. I'll see you on the next episode.